So, yesterday we had some great talks on um, risk assessment, a range of workshops and some other diverse topics covered. Um, and today, this morning, we're mostly going to be uh, moving on to emerging remediation technologies. Uh, but first, um, we've got Simon Cole talking on the benefits of accreditation. So if I ask Simon to come up. We'll take questions at the end of the session. Hi, good morning. <coughs> Bear with me. My croaky voice. This is a different view while I make, get my water. So that's the sunset over Los Angeles, courtesy of my company. They haven't paid for me to go out there yet, mind. <laughs> so this talk is a bit different uh, for the rest of the day, uh, but hopefully it will warm you up for this morning, first thing. And firstly, the not so small print. Uh, so this is all my personal views, um, and not those of ACOM. So I can wax lyrical uh, in that comfort. In terms of what I've been asked to, to talk about this morning, um, benefits of professional qualifications and accreditation. So something that's quite dear to my heart, um, albeit that I'm a, not a good example of how to do it properly. Um, I only became chartered two years ago, so that's 15 years into my career. Um, so uh, it's more a case of uh, do what I say, not what I do uh, for this next 20 minutes or so. Um, but hopefully um, what I'm going to try and do is kind of work our way through a career path <laughs> as such and then touch on these three points of, of why, we should, why we should have professional qualifications and accreditations. Uh, how do we get through all the various options, uh, certainly when we're at the early years of our careers, and then some of the challenges. So we, we've had quite a bit of um, change recently and in, in new initiatives and, and uh, schemes in place. Um, do they work? Do they not work? How do we, how do we get them to make the, our lives better? So you'll see a lot of this. This is my, my running theme through the slides. And this is my stab uh, at what a career might look like in terms of qualification progression. So we've got university, undergrads, postgrads, Career uh, develop, uh, blah, blah, blah. graduate development programs, membership, professional institutions, chartership, and then professional registration. Hopefully, that sort of accords with a general understanding of, of how things progress. I may have missed stuff. Apologies if I have. Um, but what I'm going to do is focus on this after employment step. I don't want to get into the university stage too much. So if we start off with a graduate, which for me was just far too long ago. We may then at some point progress to be in the dizzy heights of a consultant. Um, bear in mind this is the perspective of me working in a, a consultancy for all of my life. Um, when you've done some hard graft, you might get promoted to a senior consultant. Then if you're good, you might get to principal. If you're even better, you might get to associate. And then the crazy dizzying heights of a director. And then nobody knows what they'd get up to. So if we start off with a, with a graduate, one of the key things for me um, is a graduate development program. And, and not everybody has these. I didn't have one when I left college. Uh, my first employer didn't have anything like a graduate pedal program. It was basically a, a rugby kick into the field. Off you go and do some sampling. Um, <coughs> but I think a graduate development program uh, sets people up nicely. But it has some. But they have some specific aims, and maybe um, you know some development, graduate development programs are different to others. So, in terms of what we do at AECOM, uh, this is just an example. Um, we have about 18 months of structured training for our graduates when they turn up. They get assigned a mentor. They get to go on some residential training events. And if they're unlucky, they're in Manchester. And if they're very lucky, they're in Madrid or somewhere sunny. Uh, it just depends on where they are at the time. Like I say, it's an 18-month program. So it's really the, the very first sort of few months of their, of their career. And, and the key thing for <coughs> us, and like I say, this may be very different in other companies, it focuses on business skills. It's not a technical skills. 
focused program. Um, so this is people understanding some of the commercial issues of, of the work that they're going to be doing. Networking, all the new graduates get to see each other. That They may be in there for a specific task, they may be an environmental team, but they'll get to see graduates that have just turned up for the transportation team or the structures team, for example. So they get to understand perspectives of other people as well, which, is, which I think is, is as important, if not more important at times, is to get that understanding as to where you fit in and what everybody else is up to as well. Um, but, but the crux here is, is leading in to professional qualifications. So it's giving them that first step uh, it's a managed step in, in, into professional qualifications. Uh, normally that's to get membership of a professional institution. So for us, um, and I think one of the main sort of key elements of any development graduation, graduate development programme is try and get your graduates to be qualified as, as quickly as they can be, obviously not too quickly. So what does that mean in practice? So what's the next stage membership of a professional institution and I used to love this one when I was set this challenge so if we look at that in more detail what the dickens do you choose from so for some people it's really obvious and <coughs> geological society is a classic example if you've got a degree in geology and you're in the field that we're in you're already potentially um, a student member or graduate member of the geological society you just naturally progress through the various membership uh, categories. <coughs> but maybe more than one membership is appropriate to you. So how do you choose and how many should you have? Um, this is not a complete list, um, but we've got the Geological Society, we've got the Royal Society of Chemistry, we've got the Society for the Environment, we've got the Chartered Institute of Water and Environmental Management, we've got the Chartered Institute of Waste Management, we've got the Society of Brownfield Risk Assessment, we've got the Institute of Environmental Science, we've got the Institute of Civil Engineers, we've got the Society for Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry, and we've got the Institute of Environmental Management and Assessment. Deep breath. So all these institutions do different things, they focus on different aspects of the job, uh, and it may be that more than one is appropriate. So if we look at me, for example, I did my degree and my PhD in engineering. It was environmental engineering. I became a member of, uh, of CYBAM. That seemed to be a natural progression for me. Later in my life, I then became a member of SOBRA because I've ended up being a risk assessment specialist. So that was a natural um, progression for me. I'm also a member of CTAC because I do environmental risk assessment and they provide me with some very useful information and contacts. So as your career progresses, you may join more than one society and it can be quite difficult early on to, to work out which one's best but um, I don't think any uh, too many is a, a bad thing Th these are just the sort of the, the, the sort of some of the um, uh, reasons why you might join a particular society than another uh, and I've got one down the bottom and this comes back to um, really the sort of networking thing that I had up for the graduate development program really um, Join society that's active in the field that you win. So if you've got an active society locally and you can encourage your, your, your younger members of your of staff to join that institution because they're going to go out and meet other people, to me that's fantastically valuable. Um, it gets them out of that bubble that they're in, in their own company, in their own sort of uh, small group of uh, professional colleagues, and they get to understand what other people think. as well as today's days like today, of course, which are also immensely valuable in that sort of uh, perspective. So, <coughs> if we try and map some of these professional membership programmes, you can kind of see how uh, once you join a professional organisation, they can actually lead you through your career path quite nicely if, if, if you pay attention, I guess. Um, Again, for me, so this is me being a bad example, and this is the SIWEM uh, membership scheme at the bottom, and hopefully all of you can recognise the scheme at the top without me telling you who it's from. Um, I sat as a graduate for about 14 years until SIWEM really did give me a good kick up the backside and said, Oi, how on earth can you be a graduate at your age? And I sort of said, actually, you're quite right. Maybe I should get chartered. So um, you can get people like me who fail miserably to 
follow the progression that the membership, uh, the, the, the society membership allows you to do. Um, but it does give you a lovely structure, uh, and this is, this is the important thing, is, is that you know, people that are members of professional bodies, they get this structure in place which helps them to manage their career as they progress, um, whereas you don't necessarily have that otherwise. This is one of my big bugbears. Um, employer encouragement. So um, there's a lot to be said for sort of um, self-motivation um, and just get on and do it. Um, but it, it caught, from my perspective, it kind of misses the point. Um, in so much that there's so much advantage from your staff being members of professional institutions that the employer really should get off their backsides and and do something to, to assist in this. Um, these are just, how many are there? Six. So these are just six things that, that I thought of in terms of why uh, professional membership is good for employers uh, as well as the employees. Um, we've got the commercial imperative for staff competency. We all want our staff to be competent. All our clients are asked, uh, demanding that our staff are competent. Um, Professional membership gives you that structured process by which um, members of staff have an understanding as to how they can, can progress, but also benchmark themselves as to where they are, um, which they might not be able to do otherwise. Um, it also, and I'll, I'll touch on this later, it gives you as an employer a way of working out um, a structure for, for training your staff as well. Um, so you get this structured learning and development, and that can be in all shapes and sizes. Um, you get the external networking and development days like today. And one of the big things, uh, you know, like I say, is getting the staff out there, getting them inspired, getting them motivated. They get access to information, not just technical journals these days. I still get paper copies on my desk, and uh, this is when it becomes a bit tricky. Do I read all of the journals that come onto my desk? Uh, the, the honest answer is no. I don't get the time to read them all. Some of them even stay in a cellophane wrapper. Um, if they're, if they're emailed to me electronically or I have to go onto a sort of electronic library to read them, then there's even uh, less of a thing staring at me for me to read them. But the, 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 the information provision is, is fantastic. Now, uh, the last thing is, and it's, it's this whole concept of uh, a recognised scheme. So, how do we know that what we're doing is sensible? How do we know that... Uh, as an employer, uh, staff are progressing as they should. If you have a recognised scheme, everybody knows what it is. Everybody can work out where they are within it. So how can employers help? So I wasn't fully aware of this, and I'm still not completely au okay with it, because I'm not a, a geologist within AACOM. Um, but, for example, AACOM has a graduate training scheme for our geologists um, that's approved and audited, I understand, by the Geological Society and is, an, is a fantastic way of uh, enabling our geologists to have a structured programme for learning um, and become chartered. So, my, you know, navigate their way through their career uh, and the professional membership and chartership accreditations that go with it. Um, there's a big difference, this is why I emphasised at the beginning, the difference between graduate development programmes and things like this. So our graduate development programme is 18 months, but this thing is five years. This is a beast of a thing compared to a, a graduate development programme. Um, but it's based on the, on the training guide for, for this society, um, which is a very detailed guide, and I will touch on that a bit later as well. So we've gone through our graduate development programmes. We've become a member of a professional institution, or more, hopefully. Um, and then, the, what's the next step? And it's kind of eventually, like I did after 15 years, you go, ah, I probably should get chartered. Everybody seems to expect me to get chartered. I better get chartership. But why should you get chartered? So, chartership comes in, and it will come in at different places, but you don't get chartered as a graduate. You get chartered somewhere down your career path a little bit more. And it varies uh, from, from person to person. So I didn't get chartered until I was an associate, so hopelessly behind the times, really. But 
my perspective on, on chartership, uh, a lot of it is down um, uh, to the continu continuing professional development. Um, now I'm chartered, so I have to make sure that I do my CPD. Um, and people who know that people are chartered know that they have to do their CPD and they're not just sitting around on the sofa um, in blissful ignorance. Um, it's a mechanism for retaining competence. There's that pressure on you to, do, to make sure that's the case, uh, that you have to keep up to date. There is that requirement to plan and record. You have to work out what you're going to do <coughs> and when you've done it. <coughs> it's not crazily onerous, but there is a requirement to, to do it, and this varies between uh, the different, organ uh, different organisations. Um, it's part of getting chartered, but I think it also... Uh, helps you expand on your accreditation membership when you do it. And this is my big thing. So, so professional membership assists companies in maintaining and enhancing staff skills, knowledge and experience because of that. Again, with the employee encouragement, there's all these lovely things that um, we, we can list. And I'm sure that if you made a list, it may include some of those things and it, it may include some, some different things. But... You can encourage things in different ways. Um, from an AECOM perspective, when we're looking at skill development, when we're looking at uh, continuing professional development, there's different ways that we can do it. And you, you want to think that there's, there's, there's lots of different ways that, 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 that staff can tap into to this and that employees can help. So just an example for, for AECOM, because we're a global organisation and we have an insane number of employees, we have these global technical practice networks because we're all scattered all over the globe. We all have our different specialisms. And if I want to talk about human health risk assessment, I don't necessarily want to talk to the person in the UK. I want to talk to someone who knows far more than I do in the States, for example, um, so I can find out what that is. So this is a knowledge transfer system within AECOM, which is great. Um, because of our size, we also have something which is rather grandiosely titled as AECOM University. It's not a university. Um, but it is an online system for about 5,000 tra online training courses um, that you can tap into as well, so that obviously helps. Um, but I think one of the things, and this is just a, a very old actual um, image from my uh, former URS days, um, there's on-the-job training, um, which, let's face it, um, we do rely on um, and shouldn't be dismissed or forgotten about. Uh, there's a whole lot of stuff that employees can do in terms of uh, professional development for their staff around making sure it works properly uh, when you're looking at uh, learning on the job. Um, but as we progress through our career, some of these things can become a bit more complicated. You might start out doing one thing and then suddenly find you're doing something completely different. So you might start out as a geologist and be a a member of JOLSOC, and then suddenly find you're doing uh, environmental assessments and suddenly you might be better off being a member of IEMA, for example. So career routes can go up, down, sideways, all over the place. Uh, so it's important that we know what's relevant and when and, and we change uh, and adapt our professional membership as we go on. And of course, typically for most of us, this means we have a mix of technical BD and the management stuff that we have to deal with. So if we try and look at how a career might progress and how things might change, it might look something like this. It might not look like something like this, but for example, for me, starting off, I'm now at the, the uh, crazily, I'm at this far right end, goodness knows why, um, but I am. Um, do I do much technical stuff? Well, yes, I do, because luckily I have technical in front of the director, thank goodness. Um, but other people, can, they can find their careers change massively as they progress through these career paths. Um, and how do we adapt, or do we just suddenly go, hey, why am I still a member of this? I don't do any of this at all anymore. But maybe you do, because maybe it's to do with the networking. Maybe it's to do with um, that sort of more social aspect. Maybe it's because you still have that technical interest and you want to keep up to date, even though it's not what you do day in, day out anymore. So I mentioned earlier about training schemes and how they fit in, and I was, I thought I'd put a little bit on the JOLSOC scheme, which, as I said, I didn't know anything about at all until very recently. 
Um, and then you can suddenly see that this, this sort of career progression and the way in which membership professionalizations can help you and give you a structured way through your career um, can give you an awful lot of, of structure, more than maybe you realize. So I had no idea that how complicated the JOSOC training guide was. So 16 core skills, 69 site investigation skills, 48 interpretation analysis and design skills, four professional skills, all the way down to three health and safety skills, which in total, when I added them all up, and hopefully my maths is correct, 157 different skill areas, which is an impressive number if, you, if you're signing up and working your way through. So as a graduate, you look at that and go, flipping heck, I've got to get 157 things ticked off. Um, I guess it can work both ways. It can be fantastic, right, so I'm going to do all this, and I'm going to, but then otherwise it can also look a bit daunting. Um, but there are some schemes with uh, almost as many different skill sets. So we've gone professional registration. So uh, I, I thought I'd sort of finish on this. Um, past chartership, so you've got chartership, you've got it, you can hold it up, you've got a little certificate, and then you kind of go, ah, oh, what now? What do I do with this? Do I do anything with my chartership? What, what does it mean? What do I do? And, the reality is you get it and maybe nothing really changes that much. Um, but over the last few years, we, we seem to have got uh, far more interested uh, as an industry in, in what's beyond chartership uh, and how to further professional recognition of, of what you do. So there are some key things as to why chartership is really important. And, and, and for a lot of us, it's just that professional recognition. It's the, I've got that badge, I've got it, I've worked my way through my career, I've got to a certain point. Fantastic, I'll reward myself by going through the, uh, the challenge, the rigmarole of, of getting chartered and facing that interview panel and getting roasted over what I know and don't know. Um, for others, for us, I mean, it's the code of conduct and code of ethics that, that we sign up to when we become chartered that's really important. Um, for others, it's because it's an industry requirement. Our clients do demand it. You know, you can't do this unless you put someone on there that's... Uh, got chartership. But for me, it's this route to further qualifications and accreditations that, that, that's more important. And we've got a lot of them, suddenly, out of the blue. Um, so these are just six. Is everybody familiar with all of these? I'm hoping you, you, you kind of are. Um, they're not in any particular order. Um, I think it's great that we have six. Um, it's a bit like how do you choose your membership of your institution in the first place. It's which one do you go for. Well, I mean, it depends what you're doing. So I'm, I'm an accredited risk assessor under the sober scheme. I'm also a scrutineer, which has its challenges uh, in itself. Um, the newest one down the bottom, it, it was still getting to grips with. I put the little E in because um, it's suited by a qualified person, but then we actually sure went in and experienced in there, which is the E. And this is what I want to sort of finish on. Uh, Brownfield Skills Framework. So we looked about the JOLSOC scheme. Here's some more vital statistics, the National Brownfield Skills Framework. So this is more but than just being an SQP and being a silk. This is, this is about, again, how do we track competencies and, and what we know and what we don't know. So uh, an awful lot of numbers, again, in terms of how many capabilities and activities and stuff you can sign yourself up to. Um, but what are the benefits? So I promised that I would talk about the benefits. Um, stated benefits... Recruiting the right people, making sure that you, as, a, as an employer, you can set out how you recruit the right people, how you develop them professionally, how you can manage performance, staff retention and industry standards. And this is just looking at the capabilities uh, in a little bit more detail. And you can start mapping, maybe. And this is all up for, up for grabs, really. But in my view, where things sit in. And that's where SQP is supposed to fit, mine say. Now, not straight lines, dragged lines, because you can be more or less experienced and competent in these different areas, but that's roughly how it works out. So again, we've got this neat progression through career development. Um, if people don't look in detail at the 100-odd pages of, of the skills framework, you might have missed this bit, but this is a really, I think, a really important bit in terms of advantage for employers, uh, and this is this way in which you can use the framework to manage your staff development. So capability profiling is when you work out the different skills that you need for a certain 
job. Um, then you work out with a capable assessment whether they've got it. Then you plan to get those gaps filled. Then you actually do that development and then you can deploy it. So it, it's a fantastic way of structuring how you can work out what you can, what you can't do, what you need to do. And this is just very quickly, um, before my red light comes on, um, how you can do that in practice. So you can go from a graduate, for example, basic skills in certain things, don't need to know things about other things. But then you suddenly realise, actually, no, it's not just those skill levels, I can break it out. So if you look at risk assessment, suddenly risk assessment breaks out into a whole load of different things. And this gives staff empowerment as well, because they can look at this and go, hang on a minute, I want to learn about ecological. I haven't got ecological yet. Manager, I want to look at that, please. Uh, so empower staff as well as empower an employer to, to get that thing in place. But we have all that, but we still have the challenges. So we've got the NQMS, for example. It started... It's kind of getting there, but it's a bit slow. Then this is the, this is the sort of challenge that we have as, as a professional industry, is, is, is how do we keep these things relevant? How do we keep people interested? How, to, how do we make sure that they're a success? Um, and a lot of it, I think, is down to understanding. A lot of it's down to, blimey, that's a lot of effort. So you look at the 170, 157 skills Geological Society training scheme, for example, and people just go, oh my goodness me, how am I supposed to get 157? So instantly, time and cost burden uh, and sort of reward comes into things. Uh, the NQMS stuff and silks, complicated, fairly onerous process. Some staff go, crikey, that's got a lot for me to do, and I'm supposed to be doing it in my own time. Do I really want to do that? Yes, you do. Employers should be incentivising them to do it. But if they go through that, and they've got their silk or they've got their SQP and then nothing else changes and nothing else happens, they go, well, blimey, why did I bother with that? You know, what was the point of me going through all that stuff if in reality it hasn't made a jot of difference to me? Now, some people, it will make a, a big deal of difference and they'll feel great pride in having it. But for others, I've spoken to a fair few, that they do have that flip side to it. So the challenges we've got is keeping these things relevant for people so they really want to do it. Um, but also that they're used in the right way. And that's me done. Great, thanks, Norman. Um, so next, to start off the talks on remediation technologies, um, in a slight change to the programme, we've got Quentin Hume talking first on um, PFAS contaminated waters. Quentin. Thank you. On the strength of that last presentation, and before, oh, it's already gone green, so it started. <laughs> <coughs> I just wanted to take two minutes. Um, for my sins, I'm also uh, treasurer of the of REMSOC Remediation Society. And I think I can put my hands up for the steering committee to say that actually the last year we've uh, we struggled a little bit to find the time uh, uh, to, to move things forward. Um, our last conference was over a year ago. Uh, REMSOC is, is, arose uh, really as a result uh, initially of, of concerns about um, uh, process uh, safety uh, in, 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 in specifically remediation and the use of machinery and such like. We then uh, began to look at a wider view in terms of general competency for uh, staff, for, for remediation practitioners. I haven't got, I, you know, I can't say much more about it at the moment other than to say uh, uh, the, the two primary focuses at the moment are uh, on early career practitioners, which is our most active working group, uh, and it is about looking to uh, develop competency, not providing accreditation, but perhaps providing uh, assistance in finding the routes to, to which is the most appropriate one. Uh, but also uh, 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 linking people within the organisation, their, their various organisations and giving them opportunities to present and such like. Uh, the other is, is, is focusing on implementation of remediation and looking at optimising the remediation process uh, in, uh, and, and complying with relevant regulations, many of which people can't reasonably have expected to know about. Um, and, 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 and evaluating whether those competencies exist within your organisation or whether perhaps you need to bring them in for any particular task. 
So our next conference, just to jump in, uh, we'll finish off on that, is uh, in February. Uh, uh, it will be in Birmingham. And if anybody here doesn't know about REMSOC and would like to, we do have a pretty limited website at the moment, but we are <coughs> gathering momentum again to, to get cracking. Um, I'm glad I'm on early. Thank you, Gareth. Uh, there was a bit of a mess up on, on which day I thought I, I, I was presenting on. And my fault. Um, so I'll stick around for questions um, and hope I can answer some of them. Um, and then I need to shoot. Um, uh, but I'm glad I'm on early as well because um, my uh, 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 it, it didn't give me much time to sweat about this because uh, this is a presentation I've given a couple of times in the past, uh, or rather variations on it. It's not my area of expertise, so I'm getting my caveats in pretty early here as well. Uh, it was actually developed by Martin Kornelsen uh, uh, in Germany as a technology. I'm not going to go massively into PFAS uh, contamination, other than to say uh, uh, the Americans tend to call it PFAS. Uh, we've tended in Europe to call it PFCs, uh, per and polyfluorinated substances or compounds. Um, and uh, I think gradually there's a general acceptance to use the terminology of, of um, uh, PFAS compounds. Um, the, uh, the one on the left being PFOS, one on the right being PFOA here. Um, uh, my chemistry is pretty appalling for someone who's been in the business for 30 years or so. That's why I got out of consulting, actually, in the first place, I think. But um, these are the longer chain uh, PFAS compounds that have, that have actually been uh, banned um, and, uh, but are still amongst the most prevalent in, in, in groundwater. <coughs> so uh, PFAS is really all about it, it, its properties, its thermostability, its chemical stability, surfactants, <coughs> anti-adhesion properties. This is, this is what it was developed for, uh, and it's been, you know, for a, a very, very wide range of different um, uh, uses, whether it's electroplating or, or uh, fire extinguishing uh, or, or, or just non-stick coatings. Um, uh, certainly firefighting uh, foam uh, is probably one of the biggest causes of contamination. Um, but here are just some of the uses that PFAS compounds have been new, may, uh, um, were, were developed for um, uh, you know, anti-stain properties, uh, non-stick, uh, et cetera. Obviously, the firefighting, which I've just referred to. Um, just a photograph of, a, of the result of a firefighting exercise. I actually don't know the history of this. I don't know if that was a real fire or a, a, a practice fire, but it is the practice fires because the fact that these airport, airports are one of the main causes of PFAS contamination because they practice using the foam a lot. Rather more disturbingly, um, PFAS has other uses, including in food packaging. Um, personally, I don't eat microwave popcorn anymore. Um, you <laughs> might choose not to either. Uh, pizza bases as well. So um, should we be worried? Um, it's an emerging contaminant um, uh, in one sense at any rate in terms of its uh, 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 toxicity uh, and, and, and the various understandings of it. Um, it's a global problem um, and rather more of concern it's persistent and bioaccumulative in your soft organs. Uh, if you eat a fish you're probably consuming some PFAS, and it probably ate a smaller fish and consumed some PFAS in the process. Um, so there is limited but growing toxicity evidence, and I'm not up to date with the regulations or the, or the prosecutions that are, uh, that are going on in the States <coughs> and elsewhere. Um, but uh, I, I think certainly the longer chain uh, compounds are pretty well established to be carcinogenic. Um, don't panic. This is an article in the uh, uh, Telegraph when asked if everyone should throw away their non-stick frying pans. Um, I'm not entirely sure this is reassuring to me. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I refer to, to emerging contaminant. Well, actually, it goes back to the 70s. We've known about it since the 70s. It's only really since it's become a, uh, an issue for the media uh, that it's a, of any significance. And, and the reason I don't give this presentation very much is because it really it hasn't taken off here as a, as a, as a contaminant of concern. Uh, um, I think it's reasonable to assume um, we know that actually most of us are, are drinking it from the, uh, out of the tap uh, because the standards being applied here uh, are not the same as are being applied in Germany, for example, or Australia uh, and some of the Scandinavian com countries. So. Apart from the fact that it's persistent and bioaccumulative, it's actually incredibly difficult to treat. Um, 
uh, whether in the soil or the water. I'm not going to talk about soil treatment because that's not what I'm here to, to talk about. Um, uh, other than to say that in situ biodegradation doesn't appear to, to, to occur or, or, or reduction uh, of any kind. Um, and uh, existing treatment processes such as there are are pretty limited. So for water treatment, pretty much still most people are using activated carbon. Um, iron exchange ha ha does work. There are other, other treatment technologies, but it's uh, come to, you know, reverse osmosis, for example, um, but in, in terms of cost effectiveness, um, it, it, it's a real problem. Um, and any of those treatment technologies, and certainly reverse osmosis, um, but activated carbon as well, are, are heavily influenced by um, uh, background chemistry. Um, uh, other contaminants as well, so the <coughs> organics, dissolved organic uh, content, uh, particulates, iron, you name it. And because it's so difficult to treat and the efficiencies are so low, um, the waste disposal is heinously expensive. It's eye-watering expensive because actually the thermal stability means that the waste needs to be incinerated at over 1,100 degrees centigrade. And therefore, treatment technologies as they stand at the moment are very high costs with pretty low sustainability. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to talk much about activated carbon other than to show you, uh, it, really just sort of, sort of exemplify something we all know, which is uh, that, that you know, activated carbon um, you know, it is an absorption process, as we all know, and uh, for a particular contaminant, there'll be an equilibrium zone of, of, of saturation, and then a mass transfer zone as it moves through the carbon, and then onto the second carbon vessel. The problem is you have competing absorptions. We all know this, whether it's um, vinyl chloride, for example, or trichloroethylene. Uh, uh, vinyl chloride doesn't absorb very well on activated carbon. Uh, it will absorb, um, but it will get displaced uh, by more readily absorbable products uh, like trichloroethylene, for example. The bigger the difference, the greater the displacement. So if you also happen to be treating PFAS and you've got a high DOC, then uh, the inevitable will happen and the PFAS will be displaced by um, organics. The more available, the less the PFCs can be absorbed. So I, I do use PFC and PFAS synonymous in this presentation, or rather, that's how it was written. That means uh, uh, you need just bigger and bigger carbon vessels um, and lower and lower flow velocities, which means uh, uh, more cost, uh, more waste, etc. Um, it's just another picture showing the same thing. I mean, if, 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 if your vinyl chloride is, is, is over on the left-hand side and low down on this uh, uh, isotherm, then, you know, this is your PFAS is down here, and so it is going to be throw, uh, the first thing that's, that's displaced. Uh, this is a slide that's slightly taken out of context and, I moved, context, and I moved it to this point because it actually demonstrates absorption process, processes happening, or rather desorption processes happening. Um, these are actually uh, a range of different activated carbons that were trialled, and this is ion exchange, and it's just showing the uh, relative absorption uh, or, or uh, uh, di uh, discharge concentrations. Sorry about the, the language. Um, but the main point I wanted to, to emphasize is uh, this is the inlet concentrations at 500 nanograms per liter, and here we have uh, uh, over 1,000 uh, coming out. That's because it's being desorbed. So Cornelson Umbelt Technology, our parent company, uh, undertook the very first uh, uh, treatment project for PFAS contaminants in 2006 in Germany, um, and we used activated carbon. That's what you did and uh, inevitably found that the performance was very poor. So we un embarked on a process of, of evaluating lots of different types of activated carbon, and that's really why that last slide had, had a range of different activated carbons, because there are, you know, obviously coconut, coal, virgin, but there are also specialist carbons, and they, they all, um, they all, all work in different rates of efficiency. Sadly, not all at the same, not, not from one site to the next. It might be one that's better in a different chemistry than another. Um, progress was, was interesting but not impressive, so we teamed up with the uh, um, UMSIC Fraunhofer Institute, it's a bit like the Vegas Institute, uh, sort of uh, industrial kind of academic uh, um, publicly funded organisation in, in Germany, and embarked on further uh, product development uh, trials, um, mainly on absorption products. Um, this is just a, a simple piece of kit that we, we developed for that purpose, uh, undertaking different uh, 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 column tasks, different, different absorption media. We threw it all out the window um, and developed what is now perfluoride, uh, which is uh, not an absorption process, it's a dosing product. So um, instead of trying to absorb it, we looked at whether we could just flock it out, 
just like a suspended solid or an iron. Um, and uh, through development of that technology, that's not now what, what I'm really here to, to present as a, a couple of uh, case studies for. Um, microplots are generated, the PFAS compounds are then uh, either precipitated, if there are a hell of a lot of them, or more likely uh, filtered out with ultrafiltration, or uh, microfiltration, sorry. Um, it does also permit us to adjust the dosing rate for the concentration or the type of PFAS compounds or, um, in fact, the target concentration, uh, which may not be zero, but very rarely would be. It's not a silver bullet. Um, it, 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 it's really an optimization step. I think there's the, the, in, in, in most cases, not all, but in most cases, there may still be a need for activated carbon as a polish. It's really a question of whether the addition of perfluoride um, as a pre-dosing step is cost-effective or not. Um, so uh, just a crude cartoon showing, showing the dosing. If any of you are familiar with water treatment processes, just a, just a, a small dosing pump uh, and, a, and a mixer in a reactor tank, maybe 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, depends on the nature of the groundwater and the, uh, and the contaminants. Uh, through a particulate filter, I'm not showing the backwash that you would then need to do to remove the waste and put it out to settle in another tank, and then polishing into activated carbon vessels. So, um, in, uh, well, I'm not sure I can remember the date, but um, hoping it may say, um, this is a, a, a pilot test which was undertaken at Dusseldorf Airport um, two or three years ago, um, following, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, handling groundwater contaminated with PFAS, which was the result of an actual plane crash and fire event. Um, 35 ppb. Um, PFAS compounds in the groundwater might not sound a lot, but actually that's fairly typical and well above the drinking water standards in, in Germany, um, although they do vary from state to state, but they may be as, 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 you know, as little as 30 or 40 ppt. Um, in this case, uh, the, uh, we were asked to undertake a comparison of two approaches, um, just activated carbon treatment um, and also uh, one with a pretreatment of, of perfluoride. Um, Again, crude cartoon. Green is pretreatment with perfluoride, and the blue is without. Um, this chart shows the breakthrough um, uh, concentrations of, uh, in blue of uh, PFAS compounds um, uh, at a very early stage um, as a, uh, in um, carbon vessel one, and then again, carbon vessel two. The green represents the Emit emissions or the effluent from the first carbon vessel when we pretreated with perfluoride and again uh, the discharge from the second carbon vessel. Um, so in summary, uh, after six months of, of, of trialing, um, there was a rapid increase of PFAS uh, in uh, GAC1 and then GAC2. Um, whereas with the pre-treatment with perfluoride, we achieved about a 70% reduction. Um, uh, of the PFAS compounds before the activated carbon, um, which represents a very, very significant cost savings in terms of activated carbon um, uh, 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 procurement, operation, and, and disposal. Nuremberg uh, Airport, um, uh, Nuremberg down here. Uh, this was not a fire. This was a fire training area where for many years, um, uh, uh, actually they had two fire training areas uh, that's fire training west, fire training east. Um, this was a site where um, they'd been undertaking soil and groundwater remediation uh, for, for a few years uh, for VOCs, BTEX, TPH, um, uh, discharging treated water, and uh, at the end of 2008 uh, completed the project. Um, but then in 2010, they decided to build a tunnel uh, to the east of uh, the airport, which required dewatering, and that entails some more groundwater sampling, and the city uh, or the local authority had decided to test for PFAS. They found PFAS at elevated concentrations. Um, here, whereas we're about, about 35 ppb at uh, Dusseldorf here, we're, we're on average 423, which is a lot uh, in, in the world of PFAS contamination. Uh, the actual target compounds were, in, were, were uh, from this list were the, the ones highlighted with arrows, the red ones representing the actual treatment targets themselves. Uh, 
I, this is a, a, a this doesn't amplify much on the previous slide. To be honest, it's just showing the relative percentage of the, of the, the different PFAS compounds in the, in the groundwater. Um, equally interestingly, or perhaps more interestingly, um, uh, this is the background chemistry, which is just showing um, you know quite a low pH um, um, uh, and and uh, high uh, VOCs, you know relatively high VOCs, but. Um, that 26 milligrams per liter of iron, if, if you've done much water treatment, that, that can be a real um, complicating factor as it oxidizes and blocks up your carbon vessels if that's what you're using. Um, again, uh, Nuremberg Airport, together with the local authority, commissioned uh, some trials. Um, when they commissioned them, um, they weren't aware, uh, familiar with perfluoride, so we were a bit of a, 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 a last-minute uh, addition. Uh, all these technologies uh, were, were, were trialed. Um, I don't have a lot of information on this particular trial, more on the, on the sort of results, but I, ha I have some more information on other trials. Um, suffice to say, uh, uh, I, I don't have a direct comparison, but um, this is the, uh, suffice to say, perfluoride was selected, which is why I'm presenting it um, on the basis of cost-benefit. Um, just demonstrating here for each of these, these, these different contaminants, um, we can see here that, that, that but at these concentrations, um, pretty swiftly, you know, within the sort of 5 to 25 milligrams per litre dosing range, we're getting very effective removal of PFAS. Uh, here we're looking at a shorter chain and, and, and uh, uh, at the time this trial was, was undertaken, less effective performance. We have, we're continuing to develop it and we, we do have better performance and I do show a little bit one later for sh short, shorter chain hydrocarbons, uh, PFAS compounds, sorry. So we were selected um, uh, on the basis of best performance value. Um, field tests conducted in two, uh, 2014, between September and November. Um, I, don't, I don't explain much about that other than to say that the field tests effectively replicated the lab tests, and we uh, were uh, asked to upscale for full um, implementation in September 2015. This is the nature of the whole plant that was put on site. But I want to emphasize that um, actually everything in red is only there because of the background chemistry and the other contaminants. Um, the, the only thing relevant is the perfluoride and the filtration. Um, if we were only interested in treating the PFAS compounds, all of these would not influence the performance of the perfluoride. We've demonstrated that over and over again, and I demonstrate it a little bit later as well. Um, so uh, it, it as, a, as an add-on step to another treatment process, it works very effectively, but it's not limited by other, other, other contaminants or background chemistry. This is the plant that was put in as a full-scale plant. Here we've got the, the mixing reactor tanks and the, and the filtration. Um, it's about two cubic meters an hour. That wasn't, that's, only, that's not limited by the treatment process. It's just, that was just the number of wells uh, um, uh, for this phase of the, of the operations. Treatment targets uh, was 0.3 micrograms per liter as a sum of PFOS and PFAR, with a maximum of 0.23 for PFOS. Um, and a plant was designed just, just to run remote, obviously remotely, and just need one or two visits a week. Uh, here we're demonstrating uh, uh, the groundwater uh, concentrations uh, entering the plant. Uh, the orange represents the remaining concentrations of PFAS compounds uh, leaving after the pre-treatment with perfluoride going to activated carbon. And uh, actually the gray, which is not, not visible, is, is what's coming out of the, 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 the carbon treatment. Um, hence, you know, here uh, PFAS, uh, perfluoride treatment is, is, would, or activated carbon would have been, it, it was required as a polishing step. Um, but on balance, I think the, you know, these, these removal efficiencies are, 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 are excellent and better than Dusseldorf, but the concentrations are higher, so it's a little easier. And uh, we had longer chain hydrocarbon, and uh, PFAS compounds as well, so again, it's a little easier. Um, so, but I think, importantly, nothing coming out of the second carbon vessel. Um, more than 90% reduction when we dose with P, uh, 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 perfluoride. So, um, Despite the complex groundwater chemistry, it was very successful. It's not influenced by the, the iron or the uh, dissolved organic carbon. Um, iron removal uh, uh, was only required because of the GAC. Um, obviously, the PFAS is then removed as a sludge, and before anybody asked me that, then gosh, I should have saved up a question to ask that I know the answer to. Um, the uh, sludge goes uh, and is disposed um, 
obviously as waste and, and, and will be incinerated, but it's um, uh, obviously as, as, as a volume, it's much, much less than, uh, than, than all the activated carbon. Um, during that trial, the carbon wasn't, it didn't need to be changed once in eight months. Um, uh, we could then go for much smaller activated carbon vessels. Um, we're now upscaled to five meters cubed per hour with some more wells. Um, how am I doing? Can't read the clock from here. Um, okay, another recycling firefighter. Fire, these ones are a little shorter. Um, this is a 2007 uh, a firefighting event, 120 cubic meters uh, uh, of firefighting foam was used. Pretty low concentrations of PFAS. Again, we were asked to do a um, uh, two, two, two trains, only we were asked to treat without perfluoride through three different types of activated carbon and then with perfluoride through three different types of activated carbon, uh, all from one well, as Dusseldorf had been. Um, again, uh, same pilot plant was used, um, uh, 540 uh, litres per hour, pretty, pretty low flow rate, um, uh, but again, six months of operation uh, with uh, these, these are the main, main compounds of concern. Kind of interestingly, um, uh, concentrations fell pretty radically um, just in the influent water during the trial. Um, but um, the uh, blue uh, represents the uh, um, effluent um, uh, of the, the PFAS compound uh, 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 at the inlet before the uh, perfluoride <laughs> treatment. Uh, the red represents uh, concentrations uh, after the activated carbon um, without perfluoride and the green with perfluoride. Um, this is demonstrating the relative performance of each of the different activated carbons. It's only interesting because, it, uh, and I've only included it to, to demonstrate that actually, again, it really is worth trying different activated carbons uh, on your site. They will be different from one site to another, but it can make an enormous difference in terms of cost benefit. Um, so, uh, yeah, carbon two was, was in this case was better. I, I, I can't honestly say which one it is, but I could find out if anybody's interested. Um, uh, and again, we achieved between 75% and 65% reduction. Um, and actually, at this seven to down to two PPB, um, the, the results were better than, much better than we, we actually thought we'd achieve. Um, uh, so, as I said, we, we're continuing to develop, and we've got to the point really where uh, about 500 PPT would be the minimum point where we think we could reasonably add value with perfluoride. Um, and again, much longer carbon life uh, um, with the pretreatment. This is just a snapshot quick one here. Um, recovered firefighting waters. We were commissioned by a major petroleum company who irritatingly, I'm still not allowed to say who it is, um, to uh, undertake some uh, trials of recovered firefighting water because that's a whole separate market in a sense because they are obliged to recover it these days and um, you know they just got big tanks full of it. Um, so uh, I, I've got an entire presentation on this and I've tried to just cond condense it very very briefly. This is what's in that nasty looking uh, uh, firefighting water um, and I think you know this certainly presents an interesting number um, here, which is the light blue column here. There's an ionic and cationic surfactants, and, uh, the, the, you know, oils. Um, just a demonstration, de demonstration of the, 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 the trialing process and the flocculation as it occurred. Obviously, the dosing concentrations here are a hell of a lot more than we're using for groundwater. Um, um, but again, uh, uh, working very efficiently. Um, the uh, filter papers here and the residue <coughs> left from them showing you know, what's come out. Um, uh, again, um, without uh, perfluoride treatment, um, uh, they've sort of got these, these backwards, but the, the activated carbon with perfluoride treatment, you can see that we're uh, getting 99, 99.8% uh, removal efficiency, whereas without the pretreatment, um, uh, efficiency of the treatment is pretty, pretty poor. Um, so we almost completely eliminated PFAS, uh, we decolorized the liquid, we removed all the particulates, uh, suppressed any foam. Um, that really is a genuine photograph uh, resulting from that, uh, that process. Um, but as I said, you know, two grams per litre, quite a lot, but at the end of the day, it comes down to is it cost effective or not. Um, so firefighting, recovered firefighting liquids uh, can be treated. 
very effectively, as it turns out. Well, again, it was, it was interesting for us. It was a really interesting experiment. Um, uh, even for hellaciously contaminated waters, uh, we got m massive reduction in the PFAS compounds. Um, the, um, the no negative influence um, from, from the other organic contaminants. We, we ran a whole suite of trials with different pH levels, um, and I've summarized it with one line here, pH doesn't influence the process at all. Um, and in this case, we need about 30 minutes residence time uh, in, in, the, in the reaction, uh, the mi mixing reaction tank. Um, on that topic, um, you know, another area, again, from a sort of commercial standpoint where perfluoride might have benefits is tank cleaning, pipe cleaning, et cetera, where PFAS has been used, uh, sorry, uh, where, yeah, where PFAS, PFAS has been stored or transported. So again, it's really just a bit of a summary, really. This is not an absorption process. Uh, there's no chemical reaction, no byproducts. This isn't an oxidation process. Um, uh, highly tolerant background chemistries. We can optimize it for different groundwater chemistries, different PFAS types, different treatment targets, different concentrations. Um, so we're not over-treating, which with activated carbon, you actually can't help but do, in essence. Um, uh, I'm, I'm covering old ground. We, it's it's, it's com uh, good for complex groundwater chemistries. It's very efficient compared to absorption medias. Um, uh, it can represent just a small addition to an existing treatment plant um, and greatly reduce the demands on that plant um, for, for PFAS treatment. Um, reliable, simple to operate, and it can be readily tested and piloted. Um, these are what we need to know um, in terms of, you know, these are the influencing factors if, uh, uh, to, to scope out the, the potential uh, efficiency uh, of perfluoride um, before anybody gets any further um, on, on any particular type of project. And I finished on amber. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very interesting. And now we've got Professor John Lloyd, Bioremediation. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks for that introduction, Amy, and for the, uh, the invitation to talk today. Um, I like the really short introductions, it's great. I, I guess I just should say a couple of words about myself. I, I'm a car-carrying microbiologist, just by way of introduction, but I've worked very much at the interface between biology, uh, microbiology in particular, uh, and earth sciences. I've been at the <coughs> University of Manchester since 2001 when I, when I, when I set up the geomicrobiology group there. Um, right, don't press the black button is what I've been told to do. I'll make sure I don't do that. I'll press the green one first. Um, yeah, that's great. So I, when I read the um, program, I, I added a little bit in about water as well. So clearly the focus is contaminated land remediation, but I, uh, also dealing with the contaminated water is something we've been very interested in, and I'll, I'll slot a few examples in uh, the talk uh, today in, in, in that area. Um, so basically, um, my group focuses on natural processes. Um, uh, we look at the fundamentals of, of a range of different uh, processes and where we can apply those uh, into a, a, a range of scenarios we do and that does include a, a, a remit into bioremediation. So I'll say a little a bit about bioremediation just as a general primer, most of which you'll be very, very familiar with. Then I'll introduce our own personal interests which are in the area of subsurface microbiology uh, and in particular transformations of metals. Um, so focusing around the iron cycle but also how that interacts with organics uh, and, and toxic metals uh, other than iron. So we'll talk about the remediation, bioremediation of metals, radionuclides and organics by these sorts of organisms, metal reducing uh, bacteria. I'll talk a little bit about how you can use some of the mineral phases that these organisms produce for a range of applications, including remediation. Uh, and new areas to help push this area forward, I think, includes understanding how you can use these processes to capture metals from wastes and then turn them into something useful uh, that, that can be sold on to help support the, uh, 
uh, the, the process that's being developed. So that's scope. I mean, there's a very, very brief um, definition there for you. So bioremediation, clearly the use of biological systems uh, to clean up the contaminated site. Now, that can include plants as well, but just to be clear, I'm focusing on microorganisms in, in this talk, which is where our uh, interests lie. Um, but this is a very old uh, cartoon from a colleague up in uh, Dundee, Jeff Gallup. I still kind of like it. I use it in teaching. But it, you know, the idea is that you're using natural processes, uh, hopefully uh, non-invasive. Uh, you can uh, harness... Oops. You can harness these... Uh, you press the black button there. Glad I didn't. Um, so you can harness these natural processes to uh, treat organics uh, and control the solubility of metals and radionuclides. Uh, and, and of course, you can uh, do this quite cheaply if you find the right way of stimulating them, and you can scale these up quite efficiently as well if you work with uh, you know, hydrologists, for example. So is it an emerging technology? Most definitely. I mean, these... I'm really preaching to the choir here, I'm sure, but... Um, this is the most recent set of data that I, I have to hand. You, you, working in the field, might have uh, more recent reports, but certainly we, when you look at uh, studies from 2000 to 2007, this is from the Environmental Agency, you know, most of the remediation products in the, uh, projects in the UK uh, focus on containment, um, off-site disposal. But there's a, uh, evidence here of emerging use of bioremediation in the sector. Now, if you look at the US market... Uh, which is bigger, and, and remediation, bioremediation plays a much more important role there. So you've got 10 to 15% of the market. This was back in 2007, could be higher now. Uh, and, and really this comes down to the very, very low costs that for some applications you can achieve if you're using biological solutions versus these other applications. But I think certainly in the UK you would certainly put it in the, the emerging bracket. So... It's just really to emphasise the in interest that we have uh, in Manchester. So uh, dissimilatory metal reducing uh, system. So this is really about organisms that are not taking up metals because they need them for metabolism and changing uh, the redox state. But these are actually uh, dissimilatory processes. So they're, they're not taking them up. They're actually using these metal reduction processes to fuel their metabolism. And in fact, they're respiring using the metals uh, in the absence of oxygen. We're very interested in the mechanisms of electron flow in those systems, which I won't talk about, uh, environmental impact, uh, and biotech applications. So that, that would cover some of our work in the remediation sector. So this is a very simple cartoon just to introduce you to the concept. Um, so you've got a microbial cell here. This would be a specialist organism that typically lives uh, in the subsurface. Uh, it, in the absence of oxygen, it's got to find an electron acceptor to respire, uh, it'll oxidise organics uh, and pass the electrons from that oxidation process onto this mineral phase here. It's a, an Fe3 coating uh, on, a, for example, a sand grain. So you degrade the organics, uh, hopefully all the way down to CO2, uh, and you'll produce Fe2. Some of it will go into solution and some of it will stay associated with that mineral phase, either incorporated or absorbed. Now, why is this of interest? Well, a range of organics can be used as electron donors, including uh, organics that you might want to remediate, for example, BTEX compounds. Um, and some of them can actually be respired as well, for example, chlorinated solvents. Uh, now, if you look at the metal transformations, sure, these organisms are reducing iron, but they can also reduce other metals, often precipitating them uh, either within the cell or uh, at the interface between the mineral and the cell, sometimes driven by Fe2 as a potent reductant, sometimes just driven by the enzymes. There's a battery of reducing enzymes around the surface of the cell that can drive these redox transformations. So this is, again, just some nice pictures to show you the sort of organisms. This is taken with the nanosims. The organisms in this experiment have been fed with C13 labelled acetate. So any organisms that respire iron, and this is a, a block of iron oxide here, uh, can take up uh, the acetate, which is using as an electron uh, donor, and you can then see them using the SIMS imaging technique here rather nicely. Uh, now, at the, this is just um, fluorescence microscopy images showing, a, hopefully you can see this uh, on the screen here, you can see these blue 
blobs, uh, more of them with time. After seven days, you've got a coating of iron oxide-reducing organisms. And if you look uh, at the organisms on the mineral surface, they're pretty much digging into that mineral assemblage and changing the chemistry around the cell quite dramatically. Now, we've focused largely on iron, but many other metals can be reduced as well. Uh, and in this talk, I'll talk about chrome, an important contaminant is chrome-6, which can be reduced by these organisms. Uh, also, we'll talk a little bit about uranium, uh, technetium, uh, and, and there's also uh, metalloids, which I won't really have time to talk about today, but those can be very important as well. Now, many of these other metals, we now know that copper's on this list as well, but many of these other redox active metals can also be reduced and respired by these iron-reducing organisms. So we'll start off with a case study, um, and I want to talk about radionuclides first. This is an area we've worked in uh, for many years. Uh, now, interestingly, the organisms that can reduce iron, Fe3, can also reduce soluble uh, uranium-6, and when they reduce the uranium-6, again using organics uh, or hydrogen as an electron donor, they produce an insoluble mineral form, uranium-4. So it's an excellent way of capturing uranium from solution. Now, this is a horrible phylogenetic tree, the sort of thing microbiologists like to bore geologists with. Um, but the point is, there's just loads and loads of organisms in the subsurface that can respire and reduce uranium-6. Okay. So uh, initial studies focus on a couple of organisms, Geobacter and Shuanella, but we know that list is much longer. And in fact, there are many organisms uh, in, the, in sediments that can do this transformation. Early work from our group focused on uh, low-level uh, rad waste site up at Drig, and the idea here was to... I'll look at what might happen in the far field around uh, the facility. If the barriers degrade with time, uranium will uh, go into the uh, uh, subsurface around this facility. And as iron reducers kick in, and here you're measuring Fe2 uh, in growth into the sediment system, the uranium <coughs> concentrations plummet. And that's because the organisms are using the same enzymes that reduce iron to reduce uranium and precipitating it in the, uh, in the system. Uh, this has been studied extensively. Uh, we've done some work in, on UK sites, but most of the work has been done in the US, funded by the Department of Energy. I'll just give you one field example, probably the best studied one, which is the rifle site uh, in Colorado. And here there was an injection array where acetate was introduced into the subsurface, uh, passed along with the groundwater flow, and you have an active zone of uranium reduction here and uranium precipitation. Uh, if you're interested in this area, probably the best thing to do is just to make a note of that reference, and that will go through, uh, give you references to probably uh, close to 100 papers that have come from uh, those field investigations. <coughs> Our own work, of course, is focused on the UK um, megasite Sellafield. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with the site, it was initially a, a Royal Ordnance um, uh, site in World War II, and then it started to uh, have materials from the atomic weapons programs in the 1940s, and then Magnox and, and, and Oxide um, reprocessing uh, facilities. And now it's the largest concentration of nuclear expertise in Europe. I think it's up to 10,000 people working there. And there's an active program of waste management, uh, storage, and decommissioning. And there's the Queen opening the site uh, many, many years ago, back in the 50s. Right, so this is what it looked like in 1946. Now it's changed dramatically. That's what it looks like now. That's what it looked like in 2004. So you can see it's a, actually quite a challenging built-up site to work on. Uh, and, and where you've got zones of uh, contamination in the subsurface, and typically you're concerned about uranium, uh, but also um, strontium and technetium, uh, you, know, these, you can imagine these sites are rather difficult uh, to access. So if you can stimulate microbial processes or control them and understand them uh, and, and keep the radionuclides on the site, that's clearly uh, something that you would want to do uh, to help with cost savings. So to put that into context, the decommissioning process at uh, Sellafield is looking at more than 100 years. The whole cost is at least 70 billion for Sellafield. The contaminated land alone is about, uh, focuses on 20 uh, million uh, metres cubed. So if you can do this cheaply, uh, there's a huge potential for uh, cost savings. And uh, this site is really, you know, the, the science around the site is evolving uh, rapidly, and, and we hope that biotechnology or bioremediation might help deal with some of these, uh, these grand challenges at Sellafield. So our own work has focused on, for example, stimulating uranium reduction and guiding the mineralogy of the endpoint into the right direction. So uh, with time, you start off with a... a 
a rather poorly crystalline material, so-called monomeric uranium-4, and then if you leave that to age over 15 months, you get to a, a uraninite mineral phase here studied using uh, synchrotron radiation, and that's much more recalcitrant, so uh, you can kind of guide the mineralogy through these reducing systems. Uh, that's just through uh, keeping them there in time. Another approach we've used recently is to feed the uh, process not with a simple electron donor like acetate, but use something like glycerol phosphate, where the glycerol is an electron donor to drive uranium reduction. Uh, phosphate is liberated from the metabolism of the G uh, glycerol phosphate, and that phosphate then coordinates with the uranium-4 to give you insoluble uranium phosphates, which are incredibly long-lived. You can also use this process to co-treat strontium, and actually it turns out technetium as well, for uh, reasons that I'll, I'll describe better in, in a moment. Okay, so by using the right sort of amendment, you can drive that system uh, to give you the sort of mineral phases that you want that should stay put for prolonged periods of time. Technetium, if you look at the site here, is uh, uh, something that is moving uh, to the, uh, the boundary of the site, uh, and this is, this is an oxyanion, um, TCO4 minus. Uh, so this is, this is actually an element of, 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 of considerable concern. We've worked on it for many years, so early studies focused on enzymes in the cells that could reduce the technetium-7 to insoluble technetium-4. But very quickly we realised that, oops, if you've got iron reducers, then the uh, iron is reduced to uh, an Fe2-bearing mineral phase here, magnetite with a coating of Fe2, uh, and then that magnetite is fantastic at hoovering up and scavenging the technetium. Through a redox transformation, you get technetium-4 precipitating on the surface of the magnetite here. We've got a, this is the biologically synthesized Fe2-bearing mineral magnetite from an iron-reducing culture. You can mix it up with technetium-99. This is a gamma-emitting isotope that you can visualize uh, using uh, uh, nuclear medicine camera technologies. And it, it just drops out very, very quickly, even at nanomolar uh, or lower concentrations. So you can see this is the mixed magnetite drops down after a few seconds, and the, uh, the, the biomagnetite that's been produced in this experiment scavenges that technetium very, very well. Um, we've actually done a lot of work in this, uh, in this over the years. I don't know if I can get to this, but there is a, hopefully a movie embedded in that. Is that going to do anything? <coughs> no, it's not. Okay. Well, what this did show you was um, is we prepared on a Mac, and I, I can access it from the Mac, but not using this, unfortunately. What it does show you is the, uh, on these bioreduced columns here, as you introduce the technetium 99M, uh, it basically gets stuck at the bottom of the columns where you've got bioreduction with uh, iron 2 bearing minerals and passes straight up through the oxic control. We've been doing a lot of these column based studies to get this system ready to uh, be a system that might be deployed on site. We've also tried to optimise the bioreduction system by using a range of so, uh, slow release electron donors from uh, Regenesis and, uh, and Proxichem. They both work very well. So here you can see reduction of the, um, the technetium. Now, interestingly, when you reoxidize the system, if you use these slow release electron donors, the technetium does not go back into solution. If you use something like acetate uh, as a simple electron donor in this stage, uh, it bounces straight back and a lot of the technetium goes back into solution. So if you use, again, the right electron donor, you can get the technetium immobilized in the uh, sediments for prolonged periods of time. Um, We've also been working quite hard with uh, other colleagues on a large EU program called NanoREM that many of you will have heard of. This is focused on iron materials for remediation, including carbo iron, nano ZBI, uh, and our interests are in biomagnetite. This magnetite has been laid down by these reducing organisms. They all reduce technetium very, very quickly. Uh, now, this, is, this just shows you the kinetics over uh, you know, several uh, days. This is over several minutes, and the magnetite is instantaneously able to remove the uh, technetium from solution. And again, that's stable to reoxidation. Um, we've been shown that you can scale up this process, making biomagnetite for uh, injections if you want to. This has been done with a range of industrial partners, this is for CPI, going up to 50 litre bioreactors. Uh, there's some work we've been doing that I won't dwell on to try to get the growth uh, in the system correct. So basically, we have to get rid of a lag phase as you go up through these bioreactors, and we can do that through analysing the metabolic profiles of the organisms, finding out what's missing in the system and adding that in. I don't need to dwell on that. But the bottom line is you can scale this up 
very efficiently and make these materials, including from waste iron oxides, which is the current focus alongside life cycle analyses. We also want in the toolbox to be able to send these nanoparticles that have been made by biology into contaminated zones. So that has included doing work on coatings, for example, with the uh, humic coatings making the uh, magnetite particles move into zones where they need to be active if we want them to do that or not having the coatings on if we want to keep them in a, a barrier type system. Again, this was out of the NanoREM program with, with other partners. Uh, this was work largely done with colleagues in Vienna. Right, so I'd like to talk about some of the other metals now as well. We've had a strong interest in nuclear, but we also worked across the periodic table over the last uh, decade or so. I'll talk mainly about chrome-6, but we've also worked on these systems for mercury, copper, selenium oxyanions, arsenic, cobalt, um, and also gold, silver, etc. So the, the idea is that th these systems really are quite generic. If, you, if the redox chemistry uh, will mesh with the biology, then we can, write, we can use these systems. Chrome's an excellent example. Uh, Often found in high pH environments, for example, where you've got chromite uh, ores um, that have been disposed of. So this was work looking, on, looking at uh, organisms that like to grow at high pH and they're very capable of reducing chrome 6 uh, down to chrome 3 and precipitating it. Um, again, however, we tend to find in these systems, if you've got iron minerals, the Fe2 bearing minerals that you form, um, are particularly good at driving these reactions very, very quickly. So what you probably would get is a system where any iron minerals, for example, magnetite, reduces the chrome-6 uh, to chrome-3, and then that's incorporated into the magnetite spinel structure. Again, I don't have time to go through the work that's been supported by a lot of spectroscopy, including magnetic spectroscopy at Diamond, and if you're interested in the, the early work we did on that, there's some ES&T papers for you there. Uh, but more recently, uh, this was work done on uh, a site up in Glasgow that many of you will be aware of, where again, high pH um, sediments with contaminated groundwater, source treated with biomagnetite, uh, able to work very, very efficiently at high pH and forming a, a chrome uh, phase where the chrome is in so uh, incorporated into the magnetite and recalcitrant to reoxidation. That was an applied geochemistry paper. Uh, and more recently, we also looked at the leachates coming out of those uh, uh, environments. And here we've had a, a sustained uh, process where we put a small amount of palladium on the magnetite, um, a very small amount. That keeps the uh, magnetite surface um, charged with Fe2 if you provide an electron donor, for example, hydrogen or formate. And then you can have long-term sustained treatment of these chrome-6 contaminated <coughs> wastes again uh, with incorporation uh, in some of these examples of the uh, chrome into the, uh, the magnetite uh, biomineral phase. We've used these in a range of reactor configurations, including uh, a, a range of flow-through systems here. There's another es &T paper that might be of interest to you. And these systems will run and run and run and run uh, until they become saturated with very, very high concentrations of, of chrome-3. Uh, you can use these systems to treat organics. Again, this is work that came out of NanoREM. Again, Fe2-mediated systems driven or linked into the biological cycling and treating things like nitrobenzene, uh, PCE, very, very quickly uh, and efficiently. Again, a 2017 paper there that might be of interest. Uh, and in other areas, you can also use these particles to, for example, uh, upgrade oils. So this is changing a low-grade uh, sort of heavy oil to something that would be much more valuable with... Uh, um, much lower viscosity, again, through these uh, iron-based minerals with uh, trace metals incorporated into them. Right, I know I'm between you and coffee, so in the last few minutes, um, I'd like to talk about some of the, the areas that we're starting to look at now. So here, it's not just about treating the metals, um, or, or organics, indeed, that might be at a site, but it's really about uh, trying to make some money out of the process, and this is particularly pertinent for wastewater, so we're talking about re valorizing wastewater uh, streams. So this work has been done as part of a NERC consortium. We've been working on copper. Uh, now, interestingly, this comes out of some of the effluents from the distillery uh, industries up in Scotland. Uh, so the idea here is to use electro uh, bio systems, including our metal reducing organisms, to target the copper two plus, get it down to copper zero. Uh, and then you can use that copper zero as a catalyst. Uh, 
so this just shows you a cross-section of some of our metal reducers and these dark spots here are copper zero particles that are accumulating in and around the cell when you challenge them with copper two plus. Uh, it actually turns out to be uh, copper zero with a copper one uh, surface, which is great because that's a very, very potent catalyst. And in these examples, which is just impress at the moment, we've been looking at click chemistry, which is really, really uh, an important, uh, very, very interesting area. Uh, a lot of interest for making uh, these uh, valuable products using click chemistry. And this can be done from the, uh, the copper that's recovered from these sort of waste streams using right. biological systems. And it, there's a range of other uh, catalytically active metal particles we're looking at. Um, we've also worked over the years on the magnetise itself for nanomagnets <coughs> for a range of applications. And when you look at selenium oxyanions in wastes, you can make, for example, uh, selenide materials that you can use as quantum dots. And that goes, those are potentially very valuable products as well. So there's actually quite a lot of interest in this area. Uh, these are some of the hybrid materials we've made. This is from uh, waste that potentially have gold and palladium, and you get a hybrid material. Again, this is studied in a, a hydrated TEM system that we've been using of late. Um, so you can look at these, the formation of these particles in situ, uh, and then again, these have some very interesting catalytic properties. Uh, and the current interest for us really is to try and focus on uh, targeting some of these critical metals uh, that are important for ETEC applications and present in a range of wastes. And they're exotic uh, metals that are shown down here. Uh, and this is uh, being done through uh, NERC, uh, BBSRC, and industry funding. And there's a lot of interest across Europe in this. This was actually taken from an EU document showing the, uh, the, the critical metals that we need to be focusing uh, to make these high value products. Right, I think we're pretty much on time. Um, I'll leave you with a few conclusions. I mean, I, what I wanted to give you today was a, a feeling that actually below our feet there's a huge uh, resource for innovation that we don't really use enough. There's a, a lot of microbes in the subsurface, actually more biomass in the subsurface than there is in the terrestrial biosphere, uh, mainly linked to microbial processes. Uh, and, and that's a resource that we can use for innovation, including for remediation. If you understand the natural cycles, you only have to tweak them a little bit to capture metals, radionuclides, uh, and organics. The systems we've looked at can involve the unique enzymology of these organisms. Um, so you've got direct enzymatic transformations of the contaminants, or you can have processes that are coupled into the iron cycle, for example, where the Fe2, the very reactive Fe2 mineral phases that these organisms lay down can have very interesting and beneficial interactions with contaminants. Um, so that's in, in sediment systems. There's uh, an area that I flagged around contaminated waters. Uh, a particular focus here is about understanding how you can revalorize these waste metal streams to give you new products. And again, this has to go hand in hand with uh, life cycle analyses to understand whether these uh, are actually going to be environmentally and commercially useful processes. Um, and I'd just finish off by flagging other areas that are incredibly important. When I looked at the, uh, the other talks, I noticed there were talks on arsenic. Um, now, the arsenic contamination in Southeast Asia, where arguably you've got up to 100 million people being impacted, that's actually driven by biology. It's the reverse of the processes we study. It's where you have iron reducers reducing iron three mineral phases with arsenic five associated with it, uh, and then the arsenic... Uh, three Fe2 uh, mineral uh, assemblage uh, will mobilize some of the arsenic effectively. The arsenic-3 is, is much more mobile. If you reverse those processes, you can get the arsenic back into, uh, into solution. Um, so there's a, a very strong link into arsenic and other geogenic metals. Fracking fluids, I mean, that's going to be a huge, potentially a huge topic in the UK uh, if fracking goes ahead. Uh, and a lot of the, the problems that are associated with fracking fluids could probably be tackled by biology. Uh, and also we've heard about emerging contaminants this morning. And, and a range of those can probably be targeted through these uh, rather unexplored systems. Uh, this, just to stress, this is very much a team effort, and I won't go through all the names, but we've got people in Manchester working on the iron cycling, uh, catalysis, the uh, radionuclides, colleagues in Birmingham we've worked with for many years on, 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 on oil, for example. Our spectroscopy colleagues, colleagues in Switzerland, scale-up industrial partners, 
uh, and, and more recently a lot of very positive interactions with our colleagues at Vegas and elsewhere who were, uh, who were leading the NanoREM program. Uh, and I should probably just leave that slide up just to thank the people that have funded this work, including in the UK, BBSRC, NERC and EPSRC, also the Royal Society uh, in the EU. Again, just to stress, a lot of that work's been supported through NanoREM over the last few years. I'm on orange. It's almost coffee time. Uh, I think I can stop there. Um, just before coffee, if I could invite our other speakers to come up and we'll take questions. Simon. So, any questions? Yes. Paul Burden from MOD and also Jill. Um, not really a question, but I just wanted an opportunity just to explain a little bit on on the changes to silk and where we're going to be assessing silk in the future. Um, for those of you who may, be, may know a little bit of the history around it, um, it was always linked with the Lancashire and Records, um, and that's something that we've decided to break from our process. So um, chief practicants won't be needing to go through that Lancashire and Records process at the start of the exam, um, and it's more of an applied exam in terms of looking at um, you get the uh, applicant's understanding of, of how they assess coming from that. So, so I just wanted to make to take the opportunity to um, do that. Um, if anybody wants to have a chat with myself um, through any breaks about still or the MCT stuff, I'm very happy to chat. Question for John. Thank you very much for your um, program session and well. And so you mentioned obviously nano. I suppose in many examples you probably want to leave them in situ and I think that's certainly the case with some of the materials. In fact, if you don't get the coatings right, they're very difficult to, to get transported through the system. Um, to be honest, we haven't really looked at that because we really just want them embedded in the, in, in the sort of sediment systems we're looking at. Um, certainly from imaging studies we've done on our materials, they, they don't seem to move over the long period of time. Um, but I can't really talk for ZVI and carbo iron and things like that. I mean, they, they, they certainly with the right coatings could be more mobile. I, I would just, there's something I should have said actually, which um, certainly in, in, in context of regulation is, is, is important. Um, there's clearly a problem potentially with using nanomaterials in the environment for a lot of these applications. It's probably just worth stressing that actually, although the crystallite phases in there are nano, when you apply them, they're actually micron scale because they, they aggregate. So I've been a little bit misleading talking about them being nanomaterials in, in the context of cleanup because they're really micron scale materials, particularly carbo iron, for example. There's nanoscale iron, but it's embedded in a, um, um, an activated carbon micron scale matrix. So that was probably not directly addressing your question, but I think in, in the context that you're asking, it's probably quite important. Only in terms of any other associated complications associated with treating the water. So if we're using an activated carbon yeah. afterwards, then then that would be useful to have. For PFAS treatment alone, it's, it's not impacted. Oh, no, 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 very much. I mean, I think with, with Sellafield, this is very much a, a long... No, not in contaminated land, no, no. Not that I'm aware of. I thought it was the oxygen and phosphate things have been tried with different uh, things, whether that's a barrier. Yeah. Not as an injector. 
No, 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 no. I, I'm not aware of that being used at scale yet. In the back. Oh, well, so I guess we've done a range of experiments. So um, we do often use laboratory cultures to try to understand the mechanism of these processes, sometimes with very well-defined substrates and mineral phases because we want to do spectroscopy to understand how this works at a molecular scale. But we also have to do experiments where we work with sediment slurries, for example, in the laboratory, and that would include a broad range of organisms which we stimulate and then monitor using DNA tools. Um, so I think we, we, we do a, a, a range of uh, experiments, you know, from pure culture, very well-defined systems, all the way through to whatever's present in a sludge or a slurry or a soil, which is clearly much more relevant to, to, to field applications. It, 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 exactly. So our approach would typically be a broad sweep <laughs> analysis using MySeq targeting 16S, 18S, you know, genetic sequencing. But more often now we, we go a little bit further and do metagenomic analyses where we'll sequence everything and then piece that together to try to understand the, the functionality of the community. And that's certainly an approach that more and more people are using as the sequencing tools become more available and, and, and cheaper. Yeah. Excellent. Time for a couple more. Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, on that one, uh, Maddox, a question for Quentin. I'm not sure maybe. It's very encouraging to see that you've come up with a, a treatment for um, urinated, emerging contaminants. Um, has there been any progress in sort of treatment of PCBs in groundwater? Um, this is when, when established. <coughs> On my part, uh, it, as, as a business, we're primarily associated with implementing process water treatment and less R&D. Um, my colleagues in Germany have um, you know, put a lot of time and energy and funds into specifically investigating PFAS treatment in Germany, but not wider treatment technologies. So otherwise, treatment technologies we might use are, 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 are existing technologies. One more. Yep. Uh, a question for Quentin. Um, with the, uh, the, the sludge waste that you produce at the, at the end, which uh, still has the still contaminated, did you look at any further treatments for that waste? Yeah, there have there've been um, uh, uh, discussions and trials using uh, other absorptive media proprietary, there's an Australian product. Um, I, I don't know the results of that. Um, I think I'd know if it was successful. Um, I think uh, there, there's, there's potential to look at oxidation um, of the um, the waste sludge. Um, uh, uh, I know of other parties who, who are obviously heavily invested in, in chemical oxidation, and I know there have been discussions about whether or not um, there's an application there to, to put the two together. Um, uh, I don't believe that's moved to trial yet. Okay, excellent. Right, I think it's time for coffee. Okay. Welcome back. We'll jump straight in. Gareth Allen, Regenesis. Hello everyone. Don't press the black button. We've all been told don't press. I'm not sure what happens, but uh, we we'll hopefully won't find out in my talk. Um, my name is Gareth Leonard. I'm the managing director of Regenesis uh, in Europe. Uh, what we do is we develop in situ substrates for the remediation of contamination. What I wanted to do today in this section about innovative uh, remediation product is talk to you about a, a relatively new product that we've got, um, how it was developed in, uh, in the lab, taking it to beta testing, 
going out into the commercial world and reviewing what effect it's having, whether it's, it's matching what we, what we hoped for it. And then I touch on some further development um, because the research continues uh, and, and how we're going to develop from here. All within 30 minutes, so we'll see. So defining the problem, the, the product that we came up with, uh, we developed in the laboratory. It took about six years. So, so we're going back perhaps eight, ten years now. And what we were looking at was the fact we have a range of techniques. And we were looking at where are the problems with the different techniques and, and, and where can we help. So this is a graph you might have um, seen before in, in various guises. What it is on the y-axis is the efficiency of a remediation treatment technique, whatever that might be. And then going from black button left to right on the x-axis is the contaminant concentration. So if you've got petroleum hydrocarbons round about here, you've got free product floating on the surface. Um, if you've got that, pump it out. It's the cheapest uh, way, most effective. It'll reduce that concentration very rapidly. But if you need to get to low dissolved phase concentrations, you might then need to move to chemical oxidation. You might then need to finish with biological degradation to get you to those low con target concentrations. <coughs> now here, what this graph doesn't show you is that biological degradation at very, very low concentration begins to struggle. And the reason it begins to struggle there's a number of reasons it begins to struggle. The main reason it begins to struggle is, is the lack of contact. A lot of the contamination <coughs> is suspended. It's dissolved in the groundwater. The microbes that you need to degrade that contamination live as a biofilm on the aquifer surface, so you're not getting that contact. That leads to long validation uh, periods, lo long periods of treatment, and sometimes not getting to these very low concentrations. So what we wanted to do was... was Focus on that. How can we get to these, these, these low targets? So here's an example of a site that we did, just as a taster of what I'm going to explain. It's a mixed um, fluorinated ethene, ethane um, site. Um, and normally, we would be looking at enhanced reductive dechlorination, and indeed, that's what we do here. But that takes a number of months. You'll see the sequential production and uh, degradation of the, the daughter products. In this particular case, these are the sorts of results you're going to get. So we are seeing biological degradation, but it's occurring out of the groundwater. So I'll go on to what that is. So the product went through many iterations, but what we came up with was liquid activated carbon. So you will have heard of uh, granular activated carbon. Uh, I think the Egyptians first started using it for purification of water. Uh, we use it at home in our Brita filters um, for, for cleaning water. In a remediation context, uh, it's used all the time for uh, treatment of uh, pump and treat water. Um, normally, the, the, the size of the granular activated carbon is around about 1,000 micron. You might have used powdered activated carbon. The size of the particle might be something like 20 to 40 micron, maybe 60 micron, usually used for, for um, treatment of, of air. Um, or, or vapors. Here we've got a uh, particulate of about one to two microns. So we've milled activated carbon down to one to two microns. That's the size of a microbe, okay? So it's very small. And then by using uh, a, dis a dispersive agent, we've suspended that in water to create a colloidal liquid. So it's a true liquid. It's like uh, an ink, um, wine, blood, uh, milk are all colloids. In fact, it, it's very like ink. All of my site gear uh, is black these days, to be perfectly honest. Um, so the idea behind it is, is that we want to put it into the subsurface in uh, low pressure, so it, it disperses through the subsurface and it attaches itself to the aquifer. What then happens is this, this contamination that's in the groundwater is pulled out of the groundwater. It's absorbed to the activated carbon, which is attached to the aquifer surface. This reduces the contaminant concentration in the groundwater very rapidly, but it also provides the perfect biomatrix for growing uh, microbes, um, a biofilm, to then degrade that contamination. So you've, you've concentrated that contamination, which was very sparse, onto a surface that the microbes can then efficiently degrade. And what that means is you get a rapid reduction in contamination that's then sustained, the concentrations, the low concentrations are sustained, and very low targets are achieved. So the remedial approach that we envisaged 
is this. This is a scanning electron microscope picture of some sand particles. So that's a, a pore throat of about 20 micron. That's maybe 50 by 100 micron uh, pore space. You inject the product into the subsurface, low pressure, spread it through the permeable zones, and it accretes it, it, it sticks, it coats the aquifer surface. Now we've zoomed in here, I'm not sure it's very clear from here, but these are individual plume stop particles, liquid activated carbon particles. We've zoomed in, they're about one to two micron. So we're not blocking the subsurface, we're coating the subsurface in a one to two micron layer so it stays permeable. This adsorbs the contamination to it, stimulates biological growth, that then degrades the contamination, which of course then frees up sorption sites. So if you've applied it as a barrier, further contamination comes in, adsorbs to the, the carbon, is broken down, and so you get this cyclical behavior where it, the, the, the site is bioregenerating, the, the, the treatment zone is bioregenerating. So you end up with an activated carbon filter in the subsurface that is cleaning itself over time. Just envisaging that in, in, in graphics, basically, this is typically how it's been used to date, although it can be used in, in source areas um, after you've done primary treatment. You really want to use this where it's low dissolved phase concentrations. It's called plume stop. So you're generally being used in, in a plume, the distal end of a plume, um, these, these large plumes that cover large areas. So here we've got a barrier basically protecting the off-site environment, um, minimizing your off-site liability, stopping the, the, the spread of the contamination. Looking at it in cross-section, when you're in a plume, you I sometimes get sites where it's described as a, a, a silty clay, but then I've got this plume that's you know hundreds of meters long, 100 meters wide. It's, it's not just a silty clay, there's something else in there. And you get this mobile porosity and immobile porosity. You get the permeable zones and the uh, impermeable zones or lower, lower permeability zones. And it's through these flux zones, we call them, that the contaminant moves. We've got silty clays, a sand, silty clays, uh, a gravel. And the flux is the, the amount of contamination, the level of contamination, and the, the groundwater flow. When you're considering a barrier, you need to take both of those things into consideration. A low concentration in your groundwater could still be a problem if the groundwater is moving really quickly. So it's into these zones that we want to, to target the application. So you would drill down with direct push generally and inject into these uh, high permeability zones. You flood that zone with the activated carbon. It, it creates the barrier within this zone and then that'll deal with the contamination in here, but also further contamination coming in will sorb and be degraded. But also, and I'll come on to this a bit more later on, um, back diffusion. So just a quick explanation if you don't know, the, the, if the contamination is coming through these mobile porosity, what happens is you've got a concentration gradient between the mobile porosity and the immobile porosity, so you get diffusion of the contamination into the edges of these um, impermeable zones or less permeable zones. You just need porosity so the contamination can exist in there. You then clean out these high permeability zones, you change the, the gradient back the other way so you get back diffusion. So often when you're struggling to clean up a plume and you're getting rebound or, or it's lingering, it's because of back diffusion is fighting you, okay? So development in the lab. Um, development in the lab. I just want to show you the steps. The first step is checking that we can distribute this, okay? So on the left, we're going to put plume stop through uh, a silty sand column. On the right, uh, we're going to put powdered activated carbon. Powdered activated carbon, about 20 micron, potentially could move through the sand, but what happens is it, when you put it in the water, it tends to accrete, so you get particulates of about 1,000 micron, so it just can't move through the formation. Whereas with the, the, the smaller particles in the plume stop, um, and a distribution agent, it, it, it moves through the, the formation. We've obviously done a, a lot of testing. This one here, it's in feet and furlong, but that's about five meters high, something like that. And, and we're really experimenting on, on how far we can go. What happens is the dispersion agent will, it, it's organic and it will basically degrade. So the, the product will um, be in place. It doesn't keep going forever. The other thing is that, that we can do is the, the, the carbon, we work out how much we're going to accrete to the formation so we can put in enough that we know how far we can go. 
And also, we are releasing um, a parking agent to, to engineer the, the barriers as well, which I might have time to get onto. Okay, so contaminant adsorption is the, the first step of the actual treatment. So here we've got a column test using xylene. We're putting through about 11,000 micrograms per litre of xylene. We've got a control, and we've got um, one of the columns we put plume stop into. And what we get is an immediate reduction um, in the concentration of xylene. We then continue flowing contaminated water through the column, but we see no breakthrough uh, in the plume stop treatment. So we go 15 pore volumes with 11,000 micrograms per litre. So that's great, but it could well just be explained with adsorption. What we want to show is that we're doing biological degradation as well. We're not just hiding the contamination, we are breaking it down. So another test, the next step of the test would be we've taken benzene, fairly high concentrations, 35 milligram per litre there. We've got a, um, a control that we don't do anything uh, to. And then we've got two samples in which we add plume stop, but the red, we've sterilized it so you can't get any biological degradation. And what you see when you <coughs> add the plume stop is you get a reduction in the concentrations very rapidly, that's the adsorption, but then it stays flat. Okay, it's just adsorbed, nothing else can happen. In the purple, we've allowed biological degradation to occur, so we get the adsorption, we then get the biological degradation of the contamination, and so we continue to reduce those concentrations. So we get that adsorption and biological degradation. Looking closer at this and um, to look at uh, bioregeneration, in this test, we were spiking two samples um, every two weeks. Um, basically, Melinda would come in on a Monday, spike the two samples. One is a sterile soil, and the other one has plume stop in it. So it's, it's a soil, water, and plume stop mix. What we've got here is it's a, a total mass extraction. So there's nowhere for the contamination to hide. We're not just measuring the groundwater here or the soil concentration. It's the amount of contaminant mass that's in there. So we put in PCE in, and we spike it um, every two weeks. It increases, it increases, it increases in the sterile soil just as we add more. You can see in the plume stop, it increases when we add it, but then it degrades. And that's not being adsorbed to the soil. It's not being hidden. That's, that's gone from the system. It is being degraded. So you can see that the plume stop sorption sites are being regenerated, and it is degrading the contamination. So once we've done quite a lot of testing, probably about four years in to the development of the product, we started taking it to beta testing sites and, and, and trying out the injection. So this is what I showed you before. This is what we want to try and achieve. And, and what we found on these sites is, is that is what we could do. And you can actually see the product. Here we've got a clay and then a gravel and then a clay. And you can see how it stains the product with the carbon. This is quite extreme. Some of the beta testing sites, if I'm be honest, were heavily overdosed, some were underdosed. We're really trying to push the envelope, find the envelope, really, of what, what we can do. It's normally more gray than this, this real black that you, that you see here. But one of the things that we really learned in the beta testing phase was, was finding these flux zones. Um, really, um, you can get all wells are holes in the ground that lie to you, right? So if you've got a well like this and it's saying you've got one milligram per liter of a certain contaminant, and you've got a screen over five meters, it may not be the case. What you might find is you've got two milligram per liter here, you've got nothing here, you've got 500 microgram per liter here. And it's a matter of going in and, and doing really close sampling, do a pilot study, find those flux zones, and that gives you the most accurate treatment. And that's something that we really learned um, during the beta uh, phase of developing the product. Uh, this is an early beta site um, that we did in California. It's a dry cleaning facility. Um, it is a fast-flowing aquifer, a very aerobic uh, dune sands, and they had a low level of PC in the ground, I think about 550 micrograms per litre of PC. And it, it had just been pretty much at that level for many years. No breakdown products because it was too aerobic, um, fairly large plume. And we did a small injection around this area as part of the beta test. So we put the plume stop in. Uh, we actually put it in with an electron donor uh, and, and an inoculum as well to uh, seed the surface of the, the, the plume stop to, to get more rapid results. 
And you see the results here, the, the, the TCE, PCE sorry, goes down and, and stays low. No surprise, what I wanted to show you on this graph is, it, normally if you're doing enhanced reductive dechlorination, you get really nice graphs. You see the PCE go down, you see the TCE go up, then down, the DC go up, then down the vinyl cord. It's all very nice. All that is now happening on the surface of the plume slot. So what you can do is microbial assay, uh, polymerase chain reaction, um, quantitative polymerase chain reaction sampling. And, and what you can do is you can see the bacteria uh, growing. But this is interesting here. You can look at the enzymes encoding for different contaminants. And, and, and so that tells you what those microbes are actually doing. So these, these here are showing that we're breaking down TCE, we're breaking down vinyl chloride, which didn't exist on the site before. So we are getting enhanced reductive dechlorination, but you're not seeing it in the groundwater. So it's a, it's a useful thing to add to the monitoring suite. <coughs> we then moved on to commercial sites. The product launched at the end of 2014, start of 2015. Um, Lots of good case studies, individual sites, but by May 2016, what we wanted to do was take a step back and, and have a look, see if we could consolidate this information and, and see whether the product was behaving as we'd seen in the laboratory. Um, so we looked, by that time we'd had about 50 sites. Um, we tried to get the data from as many sites as we could, and we got data from 24 sites. We looked at the wells that were on those sites within the treatment zones, so not too far down gradient, so they weren't uh, affected, not up gradient or cross gradient within the treatment zones. And then we took that data and we wanted to split it up into to, to two, two ways of looking at it. Because the, the first thing is we're, we're, we're claiming that we get this initial very large reduction and then we're saying it stays low. So we want to split that data up and, and test those two things. So this is the first graph that we came up with from those 24 sites, and it's dated from the first uh, one to three months. <laughs> On the x-axis, we've got the amount of reduction that we got from baseline. And then on the y-axis there, we've got the frequency, the percentage of wells that responded in this particular way. And, and what we found is that 65% achieved a 95% reduction within 90 days, mostly down to below detection levels. About half of these sites, sorry, I forgot to say, were, were uh, petroleum hydrocarbons. About half were chlorinated solvents. There's a few um, mixed sites. There's a few strange ones like Freon 11, uh, things like that. But it was mostly those two common contaminants. 70% achieved a 90% reduction. 90% achieved an 80% reduction within one to three months. And then we've got about 10% that are achieving less than where we want to be, really, uh, with one uh, non-performing site. So in here, there's some pilot studies. Um, I think on this site, we found free product on the site. You don't want to be using this where there's free product. The, the, Napa will just coat it, and, and that's the end of the game. It, it, it's really uh, to be used within the, the, the plume zones. But here, we're learning about the uh, flux zones and getting into, into the right locations. But overall, very good reductions. The next thing to look at was the, the longer-term data. So one of these would have been a beta site that has continued into a commercial site. Most of them are commercial sites with about 200 days um, of validation. Again, sorry, so explaining this y-axis, um, if, if, if you've got a well here, that's 100% rebound. So from your baseline, you've got that reduction in that blue graph I just showed you. If you're over here, you've gone right back to where you started. Okay, so this is the amount of rebound that we're getting. So what we're seeing is that 70% show no change or a further reduction. So we get this rapid reduction, and then it stays at that level, or it's starting to go down further. 85% uh, comes down. It maybe bounces around at the 10% mark, but you've got this very dramatic reduction, and then over time you can expect it to come down. Then the remainder bar one are pilot studies where we're trying to dial into the site and, and not always getting it perfectly right. But overall, we see a very good reduction, uh, and, it, and then it stays down. So it's, it's, it's matching what we developed in the, the lab and what we did in the beta tests. Just focusing in on one of those sites, this is the Volvo factory in Ghent. Um, in Belgium, if you have a big factory, by law, you have to check what's underneath it, and if you've got something, you have to deal with it. Um, they've got a 
a couple of plumes, but this is the BTEX part of the plume. It's not going off the site, but they want to do something before it gets to the edge of the site. Some fairly cheeky concentrations of BTEX. It's in some, uh, again, dune sands, some running sands, which sounds like it'll be uh, easy to deal with, but turned out to be a pain, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Footing services, et cetera. It's, it's, a, busy, it's a busy site. Um, this was the access corridor. We did the pilot study, so we injected into these wells, groundwater flow going in this direction, and then we're monitoring from these points. Um, so created the dose, came to site, tried direct push injection, didn't work. I couldn't get a t a any of it in at all, basically. We're going down to sort of five, eight meters, and you're just not getting the sand to grip the rod enough. So when you're injecting, the easiest thing for the product to do is just come up the edges of the rod and come back to the surface, okay? So I had to pull out, drill some wells, and we installed some wells with the slots over the target zone. We then used a double packer stinger assembly. So what you do is you put this down, you've got two donut packers, you inflate them in the well, and you've got a slotted pipe in between those, and you move down to the top of your injection zone, inject into there, deflate, move down, inflate, and inject. And so you can change the dose as you go down to, to, to match what's required. <coughs> and this is the, the mixing area. There's the, the, the material. It's being uh, mixed in that tank. It then goes to a high flow, low pressure pump, and then it's run in through the door, which we did leave open at one point when they were painting some cars, and the wind was blowing in, and we got into quite a lot of trouble for that. But mostly we didn't cause them too much bother. Um, and, and at the end of the day, you just demobilize and come back the next day, and there's just wells in the ground. So these are the results. Um, about 18,000 microgram per litre at start in that particular well. After two months, we had a 95% reduction, and then after five months, we were pretty much at non-detect. So the, the main part of that site is supposed to go ahead this month. The reality is it's probably going to be uh, January. Um, so just an example of, of one of the sites in, in Europe that we're doing. So further research, one of the things that we were interested in once we started getting much more interested in uh, flux zone treatments was this back diffusion that I mentioned before and, and the fact that that can be a, a real issue for, for, for plumes. Um, so we started working with um, Tom Sale of Colorado State University in seeing what effect we could have on that. So here we have a, a Perspex sandwich, and in there we've got sand. Or is that the sand? One's the sand, one's the clay. It'll, it'll become clear in a couple of slides, I'm sure. Um, and, and we flowed contaminated water through there, um, water with TCE in there. So the, 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 I'll come to it. Okay, let's pretend this is the subsurface. So there's the subsurface with sand and clay. Got some grass and trees on there, so you understand what I'm mean. going so what we do is, you, that's it, there's the sand. So the sand allows the groundwater flow through there. So we, we, we put impacted groundwater through there. It's got TCE in it. And what it does then is it starts to diffuse that TCE into the clay that's there, which isn't taking part in the, in the flow. So what would happen is if you then cleaned out this sand, you'd then get that back diffusion. And what we want to see is that back diffusion reaction and see what we can do about that. So let's drill down into the subsurface. We inject the plume stop. You see it kind of fingering through the sand there and, 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 and moving along until we've, we've treated these permeable zones. Interestingly, though, it seems to be going into the clays, which we didn't really expect. And when, when I first saw these pictures, I was thinking that this was an artifact of it moving along the surface of the perspex, which I think some of it was, to be perfectly honest. But when we got to the end of the treatment, when you cut into the clay, you can see we are actually penetrating the clay slightly. So because it, these are such tiny particles, we're, we're managing actually to get into the fringe of the clay. Um, and I'll explain why that, that's important. So apologies for the top of the graph here, but um, not so important. But this is the, the monitoring as we pump clean water through after we've taken the TCE out of the permeable zones in this control, another Perspex box that we didn't put any plume stop into, you see the TCE is coming out of the clay and we're picking it up at the end. It goes down because we only managed to get a certain amount of TCE into the clay in the time that we had. But this is basically 
a, a picture, uh, an illustration of what happens in the real world, which is back diffusion. And you can see what we've done here, where we've applied the liquid activated carbon, is you don't see that at all. Basically, anything that is back diffusing is caught onto the activated carbon, and you can see it's being degraded. You see these little bits of, of, of the, the, the more soluble product moving through that carbon. Um, so that was great, but I think actually what else we saw was because the liquid activated carbon was moved... Oh, I've gone orange. The, the liquid carbon is moved into the uh, clays, we're actually proactively degrading some of that contamination within the clays itself. And, and so when you look at the microbial assay, you can see that we're, we're growing microbes within the clays themselves because the contamination's there and, 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 and we're um, promoting the growth within them. Uh, and you're seeing that we're getting vinyl chloride breakdown there as well. So, so quite, quite exciting uh, results. So New Horizons. We invented this product in order to deal with typical contaminants, chlorinated solvents, petroleum hydrocarbons, emerging contaminants come along. So perfluorinated alkyl substances were mentioned uh, earlier today. These can be very, very large plumes, very low concentrations, and, and it's turning out that the targets for these are, are somewhat, depends on the country, but they're settling out some things like 45 to 65 nanograms per litre. They're really, really low concentrations. And the concept was, can we do anything for that with plume stock? Well, at those low concentrations, using this activated carbon, you can get very good sorption, particularly because the groundwater isn't flowing very fast in the subsurface. So if you can inject plume stock in the ground, the liquid activated carbon in the ground, you can sorb it to that activated carbon. Are we degrading the contamination? No, we're not. It's very difficult to, to <coughs> degrade PFAS. But what we are doing is sorbing it for decades, potentially even longer. This site that I'm about to show you, uh, it's been calculated that the, the product is sorbed for, for 100 years. Now, that stops the contamination moving off the site. It stops uh, off-site receptors being, being uh, affected. It gives time to develop technologies that can degrade this contamination. And if the worst comes to the worst, you paint the fence again in 100 years. Okay. So it's something that is interesting, and, 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 and we're putting it out there. So here's this, the, 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 basically, I mean, it might not be an exaggeration, but the first treatment of a PFAS site in situ, done in Canada, silty sand, um, groundwater is about one metre per day. It was a hydrocarbon spill out the back of a, um, it made furniture, so this PFOS and P4, it's on the seats you're on now, sorry, the, the, the stain protection, etc. And they would go out and they would um, burn the furniture in the, in the, in the backyard and, and practice uh, putting it out. So they've, they've coated the furniture with PFOS and P4 and then they put it out using PFOS and P4. And, and so they have a, a bit of a plume uh, in, in the back there. So we injected uh, the plume stop uh, into the ground across that area there. And what we got within three months, we were down to uh, less than non-detect. And non-detect in this case is less than 20 nanograms per litre. Uh, it stayed that way at monitoring points um, six months and 15 months, and we're back there monitoring again. Um, this was modelled by Grant Carey of Poor Water Solutions, University of Waterloo. Um, we've got a technical bulletin on this that shows that it, it cal it's calculated that, that nothing is going to move off this site for, for 100 years now. Um, one question is that uh, the precursors, uh, Quentin mentioned the, 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 the shorter chain PFAS out there. Can we deal with them? They weren't sampled on this site. We do have a site in uh, Italy that actually used to make uh, PFOS and P4. They've got all the precursors. We've just done some lab analysis, um, some batch testing on that, and it looks like we can deal with precursors as well. I've gone red. Um, so, uh, yes, it's a developing area, uh, looks quite interesting, and that's me. Perfect, right on time. Thanks, Gareth. <laughs> so next we've got a bit of a double act, Mike River and Jim Rag. Dean Apple.
Thank you. Yeah, very pleased to be doing a double act with Jim. Also mentioned uh, Gary in Canada uh, brings in a bit of North American experience as well uh, to, uh, to the talk. Okay, talk about old age. I feel like I've got old. <laughs> when I started on this subject, I didn't have grey hair, so I feel qualified to talk about the old age bit. And I'm going to talk um, particularly on, on the kind of conceptualisation of the problem. Think about the age of some of these sites. And, um, and then we're going to talk about remediation technology. So I'll do the first one on, on enhanced in situ bioremediation. I need to jump off the stage at 15 minutes, and that's why Jim's sort of sitting here, and I've got too many slides. So that, that my last bit of mine, I may jump through fairly, fairly quickly. So we'll see how we go. Okay, so just thinking a bit about the history of solvent production and, and usage. Um, I mean, TC is one of our favorite contaminants, really, and it's been around the block. It was tremendously good at what it, what it did. I mean, when you talk to people who have used it in the trade, and given other options, they'd always go for TCE because it is, it is, it is a very good degreaser of metals. Uh, PC, dry cleaning solvent, uh, TC was a bit too aggressive on clothing and the like. So in the UK particularly, PC has been largely used for dry cleaning uh, facilities. TCA, um, oh, well, I'll sort of, sort of get on to that in a minute. So used in degreasing tanks, there's Marcus Ford of, who heads up Geosyntec in the UK for scale there. That's a photograph where, back when we were both doing PhDs at University of Birmingham. Another some unusual use for chlorinated solvents is carbon tetrachloride in the bottom corner there. And to add to the PFOS, PFOA, used to chuck these on fires. <laughs> Carbon tetrachloride was the extinguisher. You know, it, it, would, it would put out uh, fires. So it's a slightly unusual use uh, there. Okay, dense and aqueous phase liquids don't really need to introduce these to these, uh, these audience. And of course, if you pick them out of the field, they're not going to be a colorless solvent. They've degreased stuff. They're going to be mucky. And in, in, in terms of their properties, um, you know, these are a widespread contaminant because they've been widely used. Uh, and historic poor handling and disposal practices. The disposal practice was, you know, literally pour it on the ground. So that Harwell site is a sort of classic example. Uh, had disposal pits for solvents there. So we saw the talk yesterday. Radionuclides gone about a metre. TC plume, a few kilometres. Yeah, big difference. Okay, this is a rough estimate of UK solvent production. The sources there are yeah, Chemical Industry Museum in Widnes uh, many years ago. This data truncates in the 1980s there. But you see, obviously, a, a peak, late 1960s, early 1970s, of production use. Okay, a decline of those, and then you see TCA coming in. And around about 1975, when US EPA recognised the you know, carcinogen uh, potential of uh, of, of TCE, and that was beginning to, you know, then influence the adoption of TCA, for instance. Uh, however, our onset of awareness of the environmental issue, particularly from the groundwater, uh, was, was very poor. Well, there was a paper produced, the first worldwide paper was produced in 1949, and this is the entire paper. Now, you can't read the detail here. Produced in the UK, completely overlooked. Um, produced really by a, a couple of public analysts, very active in the Royal Society of Chemistry next door. So this is the, I, I went through the, <laughs> through the wall, copied this, it's directly from their library in, you know, in, 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 in there. So you, know, the, you could argue it's been known about for a long while, but it wasn't really picked up on. And really this graph then sort of adding on some of the details of when stuff was beginning to sort of pick up and when the problem was recognised. The problem was recognised really really where that sort of orange text is, round about sort of 1970s is when it's beginning to be recognised reality and it started sort of dawning on people this is becoming a groundwater issue. Okay? So that's really the onset of awareness of it. Then we've got increasing control over solvent use and disposal uh, beginning to come <coughs> in. Now, recent trends on use, I sort of gathered the data there. TCA was basically taken out because it was ozone depleter. Okay, so that was... Uh, you know, truncated fairly early on. TCE is various things in here, but you see in the second bullet point there, there's been a decline in use. Okay, 2016, well, there's been a ban on it unless you apply for an exemption. PCE is, is, is still persisted in use as a dry cleaning solvent. Okay, it hasn't quite got the toxicity of TCE in those. So that is persistent. So I've sort of taken those rough data and then begin to just, you know, just 
uh, you know, show the whole, whole profile. And obviously, this is an estimate there. And I've colored it in really sound on sort of left hand side. We've got a sort of very high expected release zone. Disposal was encouraged to ground. Okay, and then you've gone through an area where, where there was less, um, you know, it was beginning awareness. But it, it really was not until the sort of the late 1980s and the early 1990s when, it, when it's a bit more proactive. And obviously, there's been legislation since and it's more highly controlled. So, really, on the profile of input, it's, it's really off to that left hand side. So if we begin to look at a life cycle of the solvent source zone and conceptualizing the problem, we've really got to go from the beginning, the spillage, until the end. And so we're looking really across the whole, um, the whole life history of a solvent source and thinking particularly about the flux or the partition of solvent mass between the phases present. And we we're sort of touching on this yesterday with conceptual models. And having the right conceptualization critically under, underpins the sort of remediation technology then selected and used. And hopefully we'll illustrate that as we go on. A good reference is this one here, um, life, um, which is Chlorinated Solvent Source and Remediation Book. And I've taken the next few slides directly from, uh, from this conceptualization here. So just to illustrate a, a, a few things here. So this is going from stage one where we've got an active source spilling into the ground and we've got a DNAP or migrating down into, into that system, and it's beginning to <coughs> dissolve away as well, and also vaporizing as well. So if, you, if you're a fan of uh, uh, vapor migration, then watch above the water table if you're more interested in, you know, watch below it. <laughs> okay. Um, turn the source off. The DNAP is redistributed. In this example, it's beginning to penetrate down into the fractured, let's call it a chalk aquifer down below. <laughs> Okay, down into the fracture system, it's beginning to drain down into that system. Okay, that can happen quite quickly. Coal tar sites, it may take tens of years because of the viscosity of coal tars. Okay, dissolution age in stage three, where we've got some depletion of the dean apple. Okay, some zones are persisting, the plumes beginning to grow, but also we've got matrix diffusion as well. So if you go down to the bottom there in our chalk, very strong concentration gradients pushing that contaminant into the, into the chalk matrix. <coughs> DNAPL depletion, a lot of our DNAPL has now disappeared, dissolved away. Okay. If you've got a TCE source, it is relatively soluble. If you've got a PC dry cleaning source, you know, you're in for the long haul. It's five times less soluble. So just multiply the numbers by five. This is a rough estimate. Yeah. And eventually we get back to this stage of, 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 of really the, the driver there is reverse diffusion that Gareth was talking about, desorption, okay, where the concentration gradients are reversing because you've got clean water going past it and the concentration gradients begin to reverse and then the mass which is diffused into the chalk matrix wants to come back out into those fractures okay, or a clay aquitard. Okay, so if you don't do believe in diffusion, it's a lot easier to do diffusion experiments in the ground, uh, but you need a lot of samples. So there's a lot of soil samples down that, uh, down that right-hand side. So on the left-hand side there, you see a classic diffusion profile into the clay. Okay. On the right-hand side there, you see what doesn't look like a diffusion profile in the red there. And really that's because that particular clay has got sort of root holes within, within that clay. It's like a fractured clay. It's got macro pores in there, allowing the contaminant to, to you know, sort of uh, invade further within that clay beyond diffusion. So there's an effective flow component. What you do see there too is, is reverse diffusion. So there's remediation going on in the sand aquifer above here. Okay, and you see this reverse diffusion profile. And that's what Gareth was talking about. Okay, and that's, that drives the concentration. That, Concentration now wants to come back out of that clay. Okay. From a hydrogeologic point of view, you want to know whether the flow or the head gradients across here are going upwards or is the head gradients going downwards. Okay, that's a good thing to find out. <laughs> yeah, because that influences the whole thing as well, obviously. Okay, so in terms of remediation technology needs then as a generalization, you know, really one of the key points is we are looking generally at old sources. You can usually find out it's sufficient information from a site that you know, you know roughly what age bracket that may be in, okay? But generally, we're looking at old sources, potentially decades old, and that's the sort of main point of that figure. Okay, so really, we're probably in either stage three, stage four, or stage five of those conceptualizations. And you may find your sites, you know, the top end of the site, you're more towards stage five, bottom end of the site, more towards stage three. 
uh, it'll depend, you know, where you are in, in the site. So maybe a conceptualizer, you know, it, you've got to decide where you are on that <coughs> as, a, as an estimate. So the technology needs then, really, we need investigation, which is going to begin to identify the detail there, because at the end of the day, we're going to have to surgically target that uh, contaminant that's left. You know, if you've had 30, 40 years of groundwater dissolve in your source, that groundwater's taken the easy bits. You're left with the hard bits. Okay, you're left with the stuff attached with the low permeability systems, what's diffused into the, into the rock matrix, the pool denapple. Okay, you're left with those parts of the system. So we're left with a difficult job. Skip past that. So in terms of remediation technologies, how am I doing for time? Probably. Okay. Okay, I will skate through this because we've presented this um, stuff in the past and it is uh, available. Okay, so look at bioremediation. Bioremediation targets the dissolved phase, as Gareth was saying. Our interest at the particular site I'm going to show in a minute was, you know, can we do bioremediation in a Dean Apple source zone? Okay, so Sabre project was uh, done in about 2008. And this is a UK industrial TC spill site. Okay, just a show of hands who's heard about who's had presentations on Sabre before. So, yeah, there's a sort of scattering within it, so it's quite new to quite a number of people. Okay, so there's a site. We basically um, put in sheet piles within a, within a source zone area. It's a three-sided sheet pile, so the groundwater flows in at the top open end and flows out to an extraction well at the bottom. That basically isolates a, a Dean Apple source zone within that area, and you can see that on the, on the, on the, on the, on the left-hand side, a sort of U-shaped thing with Dean Apple in there. Okay, it was a very large project. Uh, Geocentic were involved. Gary Welfer was uh, involved at that stage through the BGS. I was involved through University of Birmingham. University of Birmingham had a sub-project underneath this as well. So some of the data presented was from that sub-project. Some is from the Sabre, uh, from the Sabre project. Uh, a lot of this stuff has been put out on the Clare website. So if you do, if you Google Sabre on the Clare website, you should come across some publications on this. There's, there's quite a number of other publications. So I so say we're targeting on the source zone area. I'm going to just skip down these slides just to get to the, to the, to the data. Okay, we talked to this about electron donors. John's, John's talked about electron donors through, uh, through the systems. There's a range, uh, range of uh, you know, donors that can be, can be used. So let's just skip through those. I'm going to look at partitioning electron donors. The one we used was uh, SRS, which is basically a vegetable oil. And you can probably just about make out. You've got DNAP is the sort of reddish zones on the left-hand side, but it's a sort of brownish staining. That's the vegetable oil. And that vegetable oil will partition into the napal phase. And that's part of the idea is to get that donor to get close to the, to the non-aqueous phase liquid. That provides a source of carbon as the electron donor within the system. Okay, some lab experiments, and that's without the... Um, without the donor in there, and then you've got a lab experiment with the donor in there, and then you see the sort of difference in, in, in the degradation going on through that system, promoting the degradation. And there's some enhanced denapple dissolution in there. Now, whether that's due to increase in diffusion gradients, because if you're degrading the contaminant next to the napple, it's going to increase the diffusion gradients, and then it allows more flux to come off that napple. Okay, and that's what sort of drives some of the dissolution. That'd be one of the effects in there. Okay, so Sabre site is basically uh, six metres of typical alluvial type uh, gravel aquifer system. Overlying a mudstone provides the base. Spills 20 to 45 years ago. Estimated the, the cell area isolated about a tonne of Dean Apple. Okay, so that's about three industrial drums. In terms of the distribution of Dean Apple, uh, just off to the right hand side, in terms of mobile Dean Apple, saturation is above 20%. It's a relatively small amount. A lot of the Dean Apple is actually kind of dispersed low level saturations of pore space. Okay, so it's sort of persistent in, you know, in, 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 the, in the site. Okay. When you look at the very much detail here, and I'm going to sort of really jump through uh, this. The sort of the brown lines here, once you've, that's about 1% saturation of pore sweat, that's 10%, and you're getting in mobility about 20%. So you see a peak of Dean Apple here, and it actually sits on a, on a clay layer within here. What you do see in terms of this is the, the, the red is the cis profile through here, cis dichloroethylene. 
what you do see at that interface there is as you go into the dissolve phase, you see the yeah, cysts existing in that dissolved phase as you're getting biodegradation. This is under this is pre-treatment. So it's already degrading that. So what you see in the napple phase is you see this slight increase in it. And this is the dechlorination product diffusing back into the denapple. Okay, so it's really you're just right, you know, you're right, you're getting degradation very close into that zone in through there. Yeah, I'm gonna jump there. Yeah. Okay, let's let's just there's one slide I just want to in terms of the permeabilities of this system, I want to emphasize just the permeability. We talked about underground rivers yesterday, joking away, you know, we don't get underground rivers. <laughs> you need to think about the permeabilities here. This is a transect. You know, the groundwater is going to come out diag diagram towards you. The flow is going to come straight at you. Okay? This is a trace of tessery injected bromide going over five or six meters, then monitored at the transect. And I'll count the, the sort of days as you go through. So this is at one day two day, three days, four days, you're getting the message. The residence time on this cell should have been about 35 days. It's a fast channel going straight through that cell. Okay, so, you know, you need to think about the permeabilities on these systems. Okay, it's injection through the system, so I'm going to drop through these. Um, <coughs> Monitoring well, that shows the sort of concentrations in the monitoring well. And then you see on the right-hand side, really high concentration in the corner there. Okay, that's what's in the transect. The monitoring well is just picking up that permeable pathway. For TC, it's got high concentrations in that pathway. For cysts, it's actually the other way around. A lot of cystic chlorination is off the left-hand side in the low permeability stuff. Okay, so it, I think you need to use the multi-level data at some of these sites. If you're just reliant on monitoring wells, without vertical data, you're going to struggle. Okay, I am definitely going to drop out now. Okay, in terms of dissolution, the, the bioremediation, on the left-hand side there, you see the DC sort of being, um, you know, sort of degraded uh, away. You get biotransformation, but you can still see the Dean Apple persisting in there on the left-hand side as you go down that system. Let's just drop out from that. Basically, the, the experiment, you did enhance the dechlorination rates. You can see the sort of increase in concentrations in the wells. We've got an enhancement about one and a half times on the sort of natural rates of the system. So you do see that. Mass estimations at site, this is you know, hundreds of core samples, and we've got a lot of uncertainty. Best estimate on the mass estimate is actually in the flux while at the end we can remove about a ton from the cell which matches actually pretty well with the 75 percentile estimates in the core soil samples. Okay, I'm going to drop. Okay, there's some conclusions on that. Let's pass on to Jim. Thanks, Willie. That's, that's not fair. <laughs> okay, um, so I'm going to take us through uh, some new and developing technologies, which are really designed to help us uh, remediate or assess and remediate some of those late-stage chlorinated solvent uh, source areas, which, as Mike's pointed out, will become more prevalent in our careers as we go forward, as they age along with us. Um, so one of the key components of an aged uh, chlorinated solvent source area is that diffused mass into the low permeability environments that we've, uh, we've heard so much about this morning. Um, most traditional rem remediation technologies are great at recovering chlorinated solvent mass from high permeability components of the system. So sands and gravels, fantastic. Rip straight through there. If we're going to inject our... Um, plume stop, it's going, to, it's going to go by the preferential path, it's going to miss out those. Now, that may or may not be able to address some of the back diffusion issues, but there, are, uh, there is solvent mass that will be diffused into those uh, low permeability environments. And one technology that is in um, development to help us address that mass is, is called electrokinetics. Uh, what's electrokinetics? It's, it's uh, using some processes that uh, occur once you put an applied electromagnetic field across um, a soil to allow you to um, transport treatment amendments into those low permeability environments. 
And once you apply a field, there are basically three processes that occur. There's electromigration. Uh, that's simply the migration of charged ions in the direction of the field that they, they want to go to. So they'll go to the electrode of the opposite charge. Very straightforward and simple. Then you have electroosmosis. Now, that's slightly more complicated. The um, diagram at the top here um, attempts to sort of illustrate the process. You've got clay, you've got microfractures in the clay, which is blown up here. So you've got a microfracture here with, with water in it. Now, on the clay surfaces, we have a negative charge, uh, and that generates some stratification in the, um, the electrical charge in the, in the water, in the, in the fracture, um, so you get a sort of net positive charge on the outside of that sheath of water that's running through there, and that's drawn towards the negative electrode. So you've got electrosmotic flow in, in that direction. Um, so with electromigration, we're migrating uh, charged ions, with electrosmosis, it's uh, more particulate um, flow, very small particles clearly, but particulate flow with the flow of water. Electrophoresis is a, is a, is a last, last time, that's very similar, but it's, it really addresses uh, charged particles rather than ions, but it's effectively very similar to electromigration. Now, the, the key point here is the rate of migration of these things. So, if we look at this um, transport rate in metres per day, so you've got three metres per day, Obviously, I've, I've converted this from some American slides, so hence the odd numbers. But um, three metres per day, 0 0.3, uh, 0 0.03, 0 0.03 there, um, metres. So advective flow, what we normally think about of groundwater flow through a, through a porous media, very high for your sands, uh, can you know, be up to three metres a day, but very low for your clays. Um, electrosmosis uh, is nearly as fast through a clay um, than, than the advective flow, and, and, and um, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.3 metres per day is not unusual to be seen. And electromigration, you're getting similar rates. So these are quite quick migration rates from your um, injection point from your amendment through your low permeability soils. Okay, so what are the benefits of, of this? Um, well, we don't have, to, most um, remediation technologies that attempt to address um, contaminant mass in low permeability environments use high pressure. So we stick an injection well in there, we crank up the pressure till we frack it or, or we force the amendment into the ground. Um, that can cause all sorts of problems with daylighting, um, uncontrolled fractures um, going in the wrong direction than where we were hoping for, uh, and um, loss of amendments to preferential pathways as well. Um, you avoid all of these things because you get a nice even distribution. Um, Front, through your, through your uh, treatment area. Um, and there's no need for vapour vapor, uh, capture either. So the, there are several different versions of, the, of, of electrokinetics that have been tried and are in process of being developed. Um, the oldest one uh, in terms of um, soil and groundwater remediation is, is EK Lasagna, as it's, as it's known. That was developed in the US in the sort of mid-2000s, and there you put in, you excavate vertical slots through your shallow treatment zone, um, and then use uh, electrosmosis to transport your, um, your solvents into the treatment zones where you, you then either abstract them and treat them or, or treat them in situ. Um, it's, well it's reasonably well developed and quite effective for shallow sources, but it's, it's not had a huge amount of take-up. Electrokinetic, EK Bio, should I say. Um, here we're uh, injecting electric, uh, electron donors, uh, uh, which are charged, um, uh, or acceptors, such as oxygen or nitrate, and microorganisms uh, into, um, into the source area to promote uh, biodegradation. I'll talk about that more in a minute. And then we have two variants on in-situ chemical oxidation, where we're um, using it to... Uh, inject permanganate and or um, thermally active or persulfate um, to, to treat um, organic contaminants in situ. Uh, but they, they're still really in, in, quite, in a lot of, you know, pretty early on in the development stage. So let's talk a bit more about EK Bio. We have uh, a, a case example here. This is the first site that's been taken to full scale EK Bio. Uh, it's, it's a place called Skudelev in Denmark. What we have is a, it's a PCE source um, between four and eight metres below ground level in a tight clay till. 
It's got some sand string, horizontal sand stringers in it as well, so sub preferential pathways, um, which if we try to inject the amendments direct, you know, would receive 90% of, uh, of the amendment, I suspect, and we wouldn't get much into the clay. Um, the source area itself is quite a big area. It's been split into two. Um, so for the purposes of the treatment process, which I'll describe in a minute, we've got area A at the top and area B at the bottom here. Um, and what you see here is, an, uh, is, a, is, is treatment of area A, the top one, uh, under two different arrays where we have the electrodes um, 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 set so that the, um, the flow of um, uh, electromigration is, is illustrated by the red arrow. So we're going, going to the right here. So this is where our lactate, the direction of our lactate flow and our electroosmosis taking our, our microbial inoculates is going in the opposite direction. And as you can see, it follows the, uh, the, in, the injections follow this, or the migration of the amendments follows these field lines from one electrode to the other. Um, we run this for a three month period. Then we switch over to area B and do an array on that whilst this is resting. And then we switch the array on to area A uh, again, but on a more north-south orientation while area B rests. And what happens in that, that rest period, that three-month rest period, is you're allowing the groundwater chemistry to equilibrate with the electron donor and the microbe population start to increase and we start to get lots of reductive dechlorination during, the, during those periods of time. And um, <coughs> that oscillating um, system was, is sort of run for about 18 months uh, in the source area. Um, okay, so what do we see? So in terms of electron donor, that can be understood in terms of its distribution by analysing non-volatile organic carbon, uh, which is what's shown here, some idea. And you can see the baseline condition, there's a little bit of donor in there at the start from a pilot trial. And then um, through each of the successive stages um, of, of um, additional donor and, and switch, swapping over from area A to area B, you can start to see we've got fully distributed donor across the, across the source area. What do we see in terms of the groundwater chemistry results? Um, well, each of these groups of bars relate to the results for a single well. Um, and what we see is, uh, and you can see that the, the darker colours tend to be the, the parent compound PCE <laughs> through TCE through cis dichloroethene, vinyl chlorine, and then the, the ethene and ethane. And what we see is proportionally we get more and more of the daughter products over time in each of these wells. In, in wells where we have high concentrations, we see, see an initial spike, which uh, you know, Mike saw in the SABER results as well, where we've got high dissolution of residual uh, Dean apple into the dissolved phase, and then we get a strong fall off in, in concentration. So we're starting to see you know, good uh, spatial distribution of treatment across the, uh, the entire source area. And this, uh, this, this, this program of work continues to this day. So um, you know, and as I understand it, more recent results are, are really good as well. So. Okay, how long have I got? I'm all right. Okay, um, so the next set of slides take us through another challenge uh, which is uh, frequently encountered with chlorinated so solvent source areas, which is where we have a mixture of solvents um, and we have issues with um, inhib inhibition of, of biodegradation pathways. So uh, this is particularly the case for some of the um, Chlorinated ethene, so trichloroethene, dichloroethene, and vinyl chloride can be inhibited, that reductive dechlorination process, by the presence of other organic solvents. And in particular, um, we have 11TCA, 111TCA here, um, and we've got chloroform, and then we've got some CFCs. And the common factor here is where we have three halogens attached to a single carbon. Um, that, that, that group tends to really mess with the, the reductive dechlorination process of, of those compounds. And at relatively low concentrations as well. So I think for, uh, for 1-1-TCA, anything above 0.8 milligrams per litre, approximately, you'll start to see significant inhibition of, mm -hmm. of TCE, DCE degradation through to vinyl chloride. Um, so what are, what are we relying on in order to um, achieve the biodegradation of these compounds? Well, a series of microbes have been um, identified who, uh, who help break down specific compounds. Um, so we've got Dehalococoides, which is the one um, which is primarily responsible for the late stage of the, um, 
the degradation of PC and TC through to the vinyl chloride and ethene. Um, we have Dehalobacter, which is, you know, provides a, a broader redu uh, reductive dechlorination process, and, uh, but in particular, it, it, it's very important in the reduction of, of TCA and chloroform and dichloromethane. And then Dehalogenomonas, um, apologies for the microbial biologist in the room, um, that's, that's also been identified as, 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 as quite a, a key um, microbe in the, in, the, in the armory, if you like. And each of these uh, microbes releases enzymes that facilitate the reductive dechlorination of specific compounds. Um, so I apologise to John now for butchering microbiology in the next five seconds. So, so what actually happens when we get inhibition? Um, the enzymes that are released by those microbes um, provide a site for, for the reaction to occur. So we have our substrate, our target compound, is going to attach to the to the enzyme, and that that facilitates then facilitates the reaction, and we get the breakup of the of the compound, the release of the chlorine um, chloride ion into into solution, uh, and and that's you know a stepwise process through for say for TCE to DCE to vinyl chloride and through to ethene. With inhibition, we get these other compounds that are present in solution, um, occupying uh, the allosteric site on the uh, on the enzyme. That changes the, um, the the binding site that you're looking for to to facilitate your reaction, and it's not able to occur. So it's only once you've got your in the compound, the concentration of the compounds that are inhibiting your, your reaction, those concentrations go down, that you get more of this occurring and less of this occurring, that the thing can pr pr proceed. So what you need is a, a, is a, um, a consortium of microbes that can achieve both, um, both aims at the same time. So what does it look like in terms of um, how the inhibition thing fits together with all these different compounds? You'll see you've got the, the key um, degradation pathways from PCE through to ethene down through the centre here. And um, on, on the left-hand side, we've got the TCA pathway, so 111 TCA to DCA through to chlorethane. Um, we know that once we've got higher concentrations above 0.8 milligrams per litre for TCA, that that's going to stop the step from DCE through to vinyl chloride, from vinyl chloride through to ethene. Um, Similarly, high concentrations of DCE will stop the degradation of DCA through to chloroethane. So it goes back the other way, and similar for vinyl chloride. Um, so what we tend to get is actually a sort of stepwise thing. So we, we, we can get relatively quick reduction of TCE through to DCE, but it's only once we've got a TCA down to a DCA that we can then start to get our DCE down to, through vinyl chloride to ethene, and then that allows the final step to happen for TCA. So you need both sets of microbes and then you need patients. And you actually see this effect in the, in the data when, when you run um, lab studies of it. And then sometimes in... Okay. And so what else is, what else is happening? So we've got chloroform here. So that's another group that's going to cause problems for a whole range of, um, of um, those degradation pathways. And the CFCs, again, very wide-ranging inhibition from those as well. So this uh, slide illustrates um, a microcosm study where uh, it was a mixed solvent source area that was treated with um, uh, an, a microbial inoculant that had both the, the Dehalobacter but also um, the Helicocoides so that they were able to, in tandem, help degrade um, both sets of chlorinated solvents down through the, um, through the sequence. Okay, so I'll try and get through these most quickly, so I am stopping everybody getting drinking coffee again. Um, so MNA, uh, we heard some, some um, interesting talks yesterday about cons compound specific isotope analysis. Um, so I was able to trim this slightly, uh, so I didn't go over that ground. But um, what, we, what, we, what is important um, for many source areas as they age, and we've dealt with the, the, the main, main masses, is that we may have to manage them in terms of the, the low-level residual contamination through a, a clear and concise understanding of the conceptual site model for, for the monitored natural attenuation processes. Um, MNA has been around a while now. It's um, 
it's based on a lines of evidence approach and over time we've got more and more lines of evidence as we've understood the processes <coughs> better. So back in the um, 90s and early 2000s, m and was really based on that sort of illustrated on the left hand side. The key lines of evidence were merely primarily based on looking at concentration trends. Is our plume stable? Is it shrinking? Is it, you know, God forbid, expanding? Um, are the geochemical indicators conducive to, um, to, to the processes we're seeing or so that are suggested by the concentrations? So, you know, I, on the, for BTEX compounds, have we got aerobic concentration? So we've got the um, electron acceptors there to, to facilitate the biodegradation. Um, and then we may have been some simple concentration modeling, looking at trends. Um, but really, you know, that, that's pretty much as far as it got for most, for most um, um, M&A approaches. Uh, more recently, um, we have more lines of evidence available to us. So we're looking at um, parent product mass balances. We're looking at compound specific isotope analysis. As we discussed yesterday, um, we, we're able to um, look at the extent of mass destruction uh, and the rates of that and get a better handle on, on what we're looking for. Uh, and more recently, we've got a better understanding of some of the other processes that may be going on in the, um, in the systems as well to give us a, you know, a, an understanding of where our classic models don't normally or don't always fit. Um, one example of that might be where we have abiotic biodegradation, um, oh, sorry, <laughs> biogeochemical reduction of chlorinated solvents is, is, is a new um, <laughs> example of um, a process that I think is occurring in quite a lot of chlorinated solvent source areas. Uh, but it's perhaps not as well recognised as it might be. Um, and here it's, it's really all around the process of um, having high iron concentrations, higher sulphate concentrations, uh, and those reacting under anaerobic conditions to generate our um, um, iron sulphide, which you know, I'm sure many of you who've uh, sampled in, in chlorinated sulphate source areas I used to see in black stain or terra tubing or whatever, you know, there's a lot of iron sulfide in the ground there. That iron sulfide is now recognized can, can facilitate the abiotic uh, the breakdown of chlorinated solvents through to ethene um, and then uh, through that process regenerate the iron sulfate which goes back and, and recycles through the whole, pro whole process. So where we've got chlorinated solvent source areas with elevated sulfate concentrations and, and available iron, we're, uh, we're, going to, we're going to see those things happen. Um, I think I'll just skip to the end. <laughs> okay, so I mean, one, we'll just put this one slide in. So um, this is an example where, where we think that's, that's, that has occurred. Um, and one of, the, uh, one of the real triggers to seeing that was, firstly, we had um, little going on in our sterile control. This is a, a lab study. But when our active control, we saw a rapid drop-off of our cis dichloroethene and, you know, sustained reductions in concentrations of the TCE and the vinyl chloride. We didn't see a lot of ethene, ethene there, but, um, you know, relatively con relative concentrations weren't that high. But what we really were missing was the, um, was the vinyl chloride reductase. So that's the indicator for the presence of dehalocacoids, which is supposed to facilitate this reaction. But what we did have was really high sulfate and lots of available iron. Um, and that's, you know, when we went back, through this, went back through this and looked at this in more detail, we were able to demonstrate that it's actually, it was, a, it was that abiotic process that was, or partially abiotic process that was responsible. So, um, in conclusion, uh, I think we're clearly on the declining curve of the production, hopefully, of, of chlorinated solvent source areas um, and through the decline in, in, the, in the production of, of TC and, other, and many other chlorinated solvents. Um, but there is a, you know, a long history of, of poorly understood releases into complex geologies that we're still having to address. Uh, I know that I'm still having to address a lot of chlorinated solvent sites, that, that some of which have not been even investigated yet. And we're, just, we're still at really the early stages of looking at them. Um, the legacy that they present, the issues that they were having to deal with in those source areas, are changing over time. They're becoming, in some ways, more difficult to address. Um, 
and what we need to do is to, you know, take all the advances in our understanding of the conceptual site model at these sites to um, uh, process through and work through which is the best remedial approach. We've got more tools to analyze them. We've got more tools to remediate them. And um, they're, they're out there to be used. So um, I think in, in summary, there's lots of innovative remediation technologies out, technologies out there. We've heard about some of them today. Um, uh, so embrace them, use them, and we'll see where we get to. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike and Jim. Um, so if Gareth wants to come back up, Mike as well, we'll take <coughs> five minutes of questions before we go for lunch. Five minutes. Back there, Chris. Question for Gareth. Yep. Um, so a lot of the examples you gave were laid to sand and clay. Mm -hmm. And as Mike showed us quite clearly, there's, there's potential for channelization within some of the facial deposits or the gravel layers within sand. Mm -hmm. How does plume stock cope with that? Because potentially it's going to get stuck in the finer pores in the sand and ignore these larger pores, maybe larger pore slopes in the gravel, which is also a potential pathway for, for concentration. So just your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, this is something that we really had to come to terms with in the beta testing. A lot of our previous product or other products, previous products, um, have active ingredients that, that once you've dispersed them in the subsurface, they actually diffuse beyond that. So you get close and, and, and you move on. When you're constructing a subsurface activated carbon filter, which is what we're, we're actively doing, you have to um, be very clear on understanding those flux channels and, and, and targeting where the contamination is going. So one step we do, as well as the pilot study before a job, is something we call flux zone verification or design verification testing, where we'll go in uh, and we look very closely uh, at the formation uh, so that we can target these, these different zones. Um, and then really you're, you're looking at targeting where the, the main flux is moving uh, and, and then the, the residual, we're catching the back diffusion or, or, or what's moving into those treatment zones. <laughs> so it's wet milled because if we dry milled it we'd blow up um, because we're getting down to, to such a low I believe it is consistently one to two I'm got to be wrong on that but but that's what we're aiming for if you try and have too much of a spread um, the mixing process goes bad okay uh, because of the the, the, the finer material gives you, gives you real problems. Um, the, the milling is something that took a couple of years uh, in terms of getting right. Uh, and I know from people within NanoRem and things that this, this is a, a challenge. The, dis uh, the shape of the particle, I don't know the answer to that. Um, we have a paper uh, that... Uh, it's within that, and there's a third-party paper that's come out that's within that as well. Um, presumably, you're thinking about the... the, the, the is, it, is it spherical? Is it clay-free? I honestly don't know. <coughs> the, but it, it, it's an important point, which I should know, be, because of the, 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 the interaction between the, the porosity within the particle itself and what's dominating that. So there's some homework for me. Um, in terms of the how we keep it as a colloid... Um, it's a dispersive agent, it's a polymer, it's patented, um, <laughs> but it, 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 it's, it's very much um, getting that balance of polymers. Be 
It's one of those, th the, the, the weird thing is, uh, Kristen, who came up with it in our, our, our indeed, well, the whole team came up with it, but um, Kristen led the team. And, and she's finally got this particle to move really far through the formation, which is amazing. And the first time we ever did it and showed it out, a uh, uh, regulator went, does it stop? <laughs> she's like, I've just made it do that. So, so it's that balance of, of, of getting it to move not having it clump, because it wants to clump back together, so that's what we're trying to stop. But when it crashes into the formation and hits the aquifer, that, that polymer has moved to one side, essentially, and, and, and it sticks to the aquifer. And, and it's that balance that's taken so long. <coughs> Did that answer some of those? Okay. All right, a bit push for time, but we'll take one more. I think there is one. <laughs> Yeah, the original, um, it, I, think the, I think I'm correct in saying the original technology was developed uh, as a, to help process metalliferous ores. So, yeah, it's, uh, there's a lot of work or has been done in the past um, on, uh, on, on metals uh, applications. It's not something that, that I've been involved with or we've been involved with particularly, though. Okay. Excellent. Thanks. Well, I'm sure you'll be able to catch up with our speakers at lunch.